Where's all you people? I want to see names coming up. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are around the world. Um, let's just wait. Here we go. Tony Dean is in the house. Hey, Tony. We're going to wait for some people to uh, join. KD. What's up, KD? Chicago in the house. Tamara. There's Tamara. Hi. Ian. My main man, Ian, Ian Finkel, the greatest xylophone player on earth, is in the house. That's a whole nother show, man. Hey, KD, yeah, I'm your favorite storyteller. You ain't heard nothing yet, bro. Where do you hear Mr. George Carr tell his stories? Unreal. Unreal. I just want to wait for a few more people to uh, chime in. Or maybe I should just start. Michael White is in the house. Hi, Michael. How you doing? You know what? It's 5.13. I'm sorry I was late. But uh, George and I were having such a great conversation. I forgot about you guys, man. I forgot what we were here for. Maurice Mason. <laughs> Yo, Mo. What's up, Mo? All right. So uh, I'm just, I'm just going to start because uh, everyone knew it was going to be at 5 o'clock. And whatever. You know, it's going to be on Facebook, so if you miss any part of it, you can always go back and watch the whole thing. So uh, we're here today. Uh, do I have a name for this? Up Close and Personal, maybe, with George Carr. I know George 26, 27 years now, and uh, I was very lucky to meet him. The guy's a fascinating guy, absolutely one of the giant talents in the world of soul music of our generation. And he's here in Brooklyn. I got him to come to Brooklyn, man. Ha! All the greats wind up in Brooklyn. And George is here. And uh, hi, Cassandra. How you doing? There's Nick. Nick in the house. Nick Hogg. What's up, Nick? So George is here, and um, we're going to talk about his life from the very, very beginning up until today. And uh, it's gonna be a fascinating conversation, let me tell you. I've read his book. You gotta go out and buy the book. We'll talk about the book later. We'll talk about the uh, hard copy book and we'll talk about the uh, audio book. Either way, you can't go wrong. The story is uh, unreal. I think it could be a movie. I really think it could be a movie. You know, it's just a fascinating life from uh, poverty up to, you know, the sky's the limit. So <clears throat> Keith, hi Keith. Keith's, Keith's tuning in from England. Wow. England is in the house. Misty, oh Misty. How you doing Misty? Texas, Texas is in the house, man. Hey Stephen and George, looking forward to this. Jimmy Ross, hi Jimmy. I'm going to stop calling names because it's going to be too many. But uh, during the course of the interview, I'll mention some people. Anyway, um, I'm going to take my mug off the camera because everyone's here to listen to George and not me or see me. And we're just going to talk and uh, sit back and get a glass of wine or lemonade or whatever you drink and just sit back. You're going to be completely fascinated by this guy. man. It's just a story to not be believed. So, oh, there's Ann Hardison, my rhythm review pal, Ann Hardison. Hi, Ann. How you doing? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, George Carr. Say hi, George. Hello, everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here with my dear friend, Stephen. And uh, we're going to talk about my life. You ready to go? Yes, sir. All right. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Uh, all right. So life for you started, let me get my paper here, in Osceola, Georgia. Correct. In 1940. Right? What's the year you were born? No. I was born in 35. 35? Oh, man. All right, all right, you still look good. 
born in Osceola, Georgia in 1935, and um, you wound up in West Palm Beach, Florida. Correct. At the age of? Uh, what was that, about five years old. All right, West Palm Beach, Florida. In, um, all right, it's five years old, so that was 1940. Right. You wound up in West Palm Beach. Yeah. So <clears throat> George's book starts out on Christmas Eve of uh, 1950. Correct. You're down there in West Palm Beach. And George, I don't know if you guys know this, but George was a, an amazing athlete. He was a two-letter man in basketball and football. Correct. And uh, also a, a tough boxer. We'll talk about that later. And um, so the story starts out on Christmas Eve, 1950. You're playing basketball. Correct. Right? With your buddies. Now, here, now just, just think about this. Picture this as a movie. Because this has to become a movie. His friends' names are Pop, Marion, G.W., Tough Guy, Vic, his brother, Victor Kerr, his friend Bo, Clarence, and last but not least, Nut. <laughs> Correct. Right? Yes. And these were your buddies. Yes. And um, you were playing ball, and um, you were all talking about what you were going to get for Christmas. Correct. Right, and, and all your little friends were saying, oh, I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that. And uh, you weren't getting anything for Christmas because we were poor. You were poor. Yes. And then uh, tough guy got in your face and said something to you about. Yeah, he said he was getting a bicycle. And I knew I wasn't getting a bicycle, so I had the ball, and I threw the ball over the fence. Yeah. So he asked me, he says, what's your problem? And I got in his face, and I said, you tough guy, because I tell you what to do. Let's see how tough you are. And he chickened out. OK? All right, so. He chickened out, and he walked away. And uh, then you were always getting into mischief. Yes. When you were a little kid, right. you uh, shot a girl in the eye with a slingshot? Yes, my mother's best friend, uh, Dora, uh, she was very, very uh, nasty with me. She was older than I was, and she could beat me. So we fought and fought and fought, but she kicked my behind. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, she beat me up. <laughs> so I went across the street, and I was very good with a slingshot. I said, this is for over your head, and this is for your eye. And with a marble, I shot her eye. And the only reason I didn't go to, uh, you know, this little home for the, you know, for the bad kids, is her mother was my mother's best friend. And that's how I got away. With that. And what happened to her eye? Well, she lost the eye. She lost the eye. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's tough. And then, as if that wasn't enough, the police came to your house because you were stealing mangoes off people's trees. Correct. We used to go, I used to have little guys, you know, my little boys, you know, our little friends and everything. And we used to go and we used to raid people mango trees. So um, I was the ring leader, so the policeman used to come to my house. Anything happened, they used to come over to my house. So they came and says, um, they tell me that your kids was um, raiding mango trees. And your son, Earl, my mother said, not Earl. Earl don't leave the house. You must be talking about George. She said, but we'll handle it. And my father did. He handled it. How do you handle it? He had a strap they yeah. called, called right. Bessa for Mango. That's what he called a strap. What, what was it called? Bessa for Mango. <laughs> Bessa for Mango. Okay. And right. he gave me a licking. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you didn't take any more mangoes? No, I didn't take any more mangoes. <laughs> All right. I'm going to jump around a bit. I don't want to, you know, because the book is fascinating and uh, I don't want to tell the whole book because you guys should go out and read it for yourself. And it's just chock full of stuff that's not to be believed. I'm just skipping around to like important, you know, uh, dates and stuff like that. So then we're going to skip to two years later. And uh, you guys were poor. And your dad took a job. He went up to New Jersey, to Newark. Yes. To find a job. Well, this is the way it happened. Uh, my um, father told my mother, says, look, I can't earn a living, a decent living here. So I'm going to call my, my brother Lester to seek to get me a job in Newark. So he called my, my uncle Lester and they got him a job. And he left and left us down there. And um, he get, gave him a job, got him a job, and then he sent for my mother and my sister. And you stayed behind. We, we st I stayed, me and my older brother, we stayed because we were in school and I wanted to finish school in West Palm Beach, Florida. Right. So then you were uh, involved in football games? Football and basketball. You were the quarterback? Yes, I was. You were a star quarterback and uh, you used to make up your own plays. In the huddle. Yeah, I did that, and uh, I got benched for that. And you got benched for that, but then eventually, every once in a while, the coach would let you call a play. Yes. Right? Yes. So, you, you know, you can see George's personality. He was uh, his own man, you know. and uh, you know, <laughs> He was involved with other people, but he was his own man for sure. And um, so you were playing football and basketball. You were a two-letter man. And uh, were you bowling down there yet or no? No. Not yet. A, That's I was later. setting pins. Okay. You, you're setting pins. Yeah. All right. So meanwhile, you would participate in all these singing contests. Yes. While you were down in West Palm Beach. And right. you would win all of them. Yes. And there, who was the guy? There was one Hoy, guy. He was my Hoy. friend. He used to always come in second. I used to always get the $5. That, that was the first prize. The $5. That's a lot of yes. money. Oh, yeah, it was a lot of money back then. Right? Didn't Five matter. bucks? Right. Yeah. And second place was a T-shirt. So he would always get the T-shirt. I would always get the five dollars. <laughs> Can't buy nothing with a T-shirt. All right. So um, let's see. And all this time, you're, you're winning contests and uh, singing contests, and these songs just start popping into your head. Yeah, well, let me just tell you how that happened. When I was about seven years old, I, wo I woke up and all I could hear was music in my head, different instruments. At that particular time, I didn't know what you would call them, but I later found out they were horns, strings, violas, cellos, harp, bass, piano. And this was all in your head? All in my head coming at me at one time. I was about seven. That's amazing. That's like, that's like divine intervention, man. I mean, a kid, seven year old kid, you're hearing all these instruments and right. sounds and melodies and stuff like that right. at seven years old. Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So, um, eventually you won, uh, one of the contests that you won, you sang walking my baby back home. Correct which was a hit by Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole, he's one of my heroes. He he, and, um, uh, Billy Eckstein. Billy Eckstein. Those were Anybody my, else? No, just those two. Guys. Billy Eckstein and uh, Mr. B. Mr. B. Mr. B, right? Correct. And, uh, and Nat, everybody, Nat wanted, King Cole. everybody wanted to be Nat. Right. Back right. in those days, Correct. right? Correct. He was the man. He was the man. Jesse Belvin wanted to be yeah. Nat King Cole. Yeah. Marvin Gaye wanted to be Nat King Cole. And if you remember, his first Motown album right. failed miserably. Correct. Because it just wasn't the time for that. You know, people didn't want to hear him singing that. Correct. You know what I mean? But once Mar 
Marvin's next album, Stubborn Kind of Fella, he became an international superstar. And eventually down the road, right. he did a few albums of standards and stuff right. like that, which is he always wanted to do. So you and him had Nat King Cole in common. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, now let's talk about um, Black Town and White Town in West Palm Beach. Yeah, in West Palm Beach, there was White Town and Black Town. So my friend and I want to go down to uh, the uh, Woodworth store. Hi, Cynthia. And uh, what we did was um, I was really thirsty. They had taken a hammer and broke the fountain, the colored fountain. So there was a white fountain and a black fountain. Correct. And you could only drink out of the black fountain. Right. And they broke right. that fountain. Right. So. I told uh, my friend GW, I'm going to get a drink from this fountain. So I went and started drinking from the fountain. When I turned around, all I saw was these white people surrounding me. And I remember this big, fat white lady. She weighed about 200 pounds. And she said, you dirty black nigga. We're going to tar and feather you. So I backed out of the place. We was backing out, and I backed out, and I ran, and we got on the bicycle and, and went back to Color Town. So I almost got killed for drinking from a fountain. Right. Yeah, well, you, that, was a, that was a ballsy move, man. It sure you, was. Your, I friend do told, it again. your friend told you not to you do told it. told me not to do it. GW told you not to yeah, do oh, it. Yeah, oh, yeah. What does GW stand for? Oh, uh, George Washington. That was his George name. Washington. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I guess uh, yeah. I would I would want to be called GW too. All right. All right. And um, so and then there was one more thing that your mom told you when you were walking in the street. Oh yeah, my mother said, George, if you're walking down the street, and if you meet some white people coming, make sure you give them the whole sidewalk. Don't get hit by cars but give them the whole sidewalk. So I thought my mother was telling me that because they were better than I was. But really, later on, I found out that my mother was really saving my life. Because back there during that time, if you look wrong, you could right. get hung. Right. That's some scary stuff, man. Yes, it was. And you lived it. Yeah, I lived you it. lived it, man. Yes, it's absolutely okay. incredible. People read about this stuff, but you lived it, and your and uh, your parents or your dad always told you to not drink and smoke and stay straight. Yeah, right. My parents told me that, and then my coach they told me says you you're a very good athlete. You know, he says uh, don't drink and smoke, don't dissipate. And uh, we can get a we can get a scholarship because I was a very good athlete, basketball and football. So I never drank and I never smoked. To this day, no form of drugs have I ever taken in my life. No cigarettes. Nothing. No liquor. Nothing. That's that's incredible. It's yes. Incredible. You listened to your parents. Yes, I did. Which was uh, a good thing to do. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to jump to. Um, your father went up to Newark, and uh, he got situated up there. Yes. And he sent for your mother. And my uh, sister. Sister. And you. And then my little brother, and left me and, and my older brother there with my grandmother. Your older brother was? Earl Kirk. Earl. Yes. And, and you stayed behind while they went up to Newark Correct. and got situated. Correct. And you stayed with your grandparents. Correct. All right, and uh, let's see what's next. Um, so then, after that, um, I played football and I played basketball. And then, after I graduated, my mother came down, right, and uh, took me back to took me back with her to Newark, New Jersey. So, so now you were all up there. Yeah, we were all. And Newark. Victor was already there? Yeah, Vic was there, yeah. So when I got there, um, Victor took me down on the steps and he says, George, he said, I just want you to know 
they have gangs up here. You have to belong to a gang. Say so we are in the valley, so we're the valley boys. Uh, the guys on the hill is considered the outlaws, and the guys down in the net is con considered the Mohawks. You have to stay in your territory. If you don't, you could get killed. And I say, what is going on here? I said, all I want to do is to write songs. Right. So you came from, you came from West Palm, which was racially uh, charged and tense, right. and then you get up to Newark, and it's a whole different kind of mess. Correct. You got the gangs. That's right. You got, uh, and then you got into boxing. Well, not really. When I got there, uh, the guys, Vic took me down uh, to the Miller Street School where all the guys was hanging out. So you got to meet all the guys. So when I got there, um, this guy that, you know, ran the recreation place center, he said, um, George, um, can you box? And then this guy by the name of Henry Chambers said, yeah, George, can you box? I said, a little. So the guy went and got the boxing gloves and everything, and uh, we was going to have a little boxing match. But while the guy was putting on his boxing gloves, I got my boxing gloves on, and I snuck him and knocked them out cold. <laughs> I wasn't going to take no chance. That's right. Of him beating me. Ain't no laws in the street, man, right? No. So that, that really got me over with the guys. The guys really liked where I was coming from. And then you had the whole gang thing. Yeah, yeah, the gang thing. The guys told me, look, we're going to rumble. And uh, rumbling me, we got to fight. So my brother Vic said, look, we got to get you suited up. So I had to go and get a leather jacket. I had to go and get a chain that you put around your hand, wrist. That way, when you're swinging the chain, and if you get knocked down and everything, you, you never leave, lose the chain. So you, you had to fight. So I said, all I want to do is to write. And that's all you wanted to do was write. Write my songs. And then you mentioned it to your father, and your father said? Yeah, I told my father, I says, look, I says, I'm going to make money with my music. And my father says, George, I think that's a hobby, and I think you should get a, a real job. Says, you know, like at the post office. You know, that way you can retire and have a pension. And I said, no, I want to write songs. So he said, well, I'm going to take care of you. This is after I come from West Palm Beach. I was At that time, I was 17. And he said, I'm going to take care of you for a year. He Do gave you one year? Yes. To, to do whatever I wanted to do in my music. As far as music. Right. I didn't have to try to get a job or anything. And then, so you formed the first. So yeah, so what I did, my brother told me, he says, look, they got little groups up here, singing groups up here. He said, what are, what are the groups? Is the parakeets? They're very, very good. I says, what? I the says, parakeets. Yeah. So I says, what? I says, I want to form a group. That way I can be able to get my songs. So I said, who do you know? He says, there's a guy by the name of Nelson Lamb. He's pretty good. Bobby Jones, Howard Curry, and he says, uh, we your can brother put them Vic, together. Yeah. and your brother Vic, and my brother Vic. Mm -hmm. I said, well, bring them down to the Miller Street School. I got these songs and I got harmonies I want to teach them. So when we got down there, um, Howard says, you know, my brother Tal is in the Parakeets. They are very, very great group. And I says, oh, yeah, I says, I said, but we're going to be better than them, I say, because they're known locally. We're going to be known all over the world. Howard Curry looked at me like I was crazy. So I taught him and taught him all these harmonies, and, and we went on and rehearsed so and who, rehearsed. And who rehearsed. taught you all the harmonies? God taught <laughs> me. Right. These harmonies was in my head. The music was in my head. I never 
went to any kind of school. Never studied years. anything? Never studied anything. But I knew how horns should go. I knew how strings should go. I knew tempos. I, I just knew music. So I formed this group, the Serenaders, the original Serenaders. The original Serenaders. Howard Curry, Nelson Lamb, Bobby Jones, Victor Kerr, and myself. And Victor could sing? Baritone. He was good. Yeah. But he didn't have what you had. No. He didn't hear music and tell. No, no. That was, you were special. And your resolve was unbelievable because you were you were a very confident young man from Jump Street. Yes, I was. And you knew you knew that you were going to make it. Yes, I did. You just knew it. Yeah, yeah. And nobody could stop you. No, 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 no. I I knew that there were going to be some. I was going to earn my living out of music. I knew that. So then you started writing songs. Yes. And you wrote. I wrote a letter. Right. And dance, darling, dance, give me a girl and a few other songs. Uh, all right. And um, then you got drafted. Well, what happened after that? No, what I did, um, when I wrote those songs, um, there was a friend of my mother's by the name of Claude. Claude, right, right. I yeah. forgot about Claude. And Claude uh, uh, came and listened to the group, and he said that he knew a guy um that had a little record company and he was gonna take me to new york my group to new york so i auditioned for them and the guy liked us who did he know claude um, claude is alan sabbath this guy was by the name of alan sabbath alan sabbath yeah and he owned this record company uh chock full of hits all right wait one second excuse me guys i'm just going to reach over and show you A chock full of hit, what a chock full of hit record looks like. This is a reissue. If, uh, if it was an original, it would be uh, about 300 bucks. Let me get this in front here. And there it is. Give me a girl, the Serenaders. And the flip side, Dance, Darling, Dance. And the other one was I Wrote a Letter. Correct. And what was the flip of that? Don't start me the line. I can't remember it. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, never let me go. Oh, never let. How me could you forget that? That's right. That was the A side. Right. That was the A side. Never let me go. And George and I were talking before about. Um, I remember the first time I heard "Never Let Me Go," and I said, "Hey, that's the Johnny Ace song." <laughs> You know, I mean, Johnny Ace had the original, but most Correct. people in, in this generation knew it by the impressions and right. Curtis Mayfield. Right. But Johnny Ace wrote it, and he had the original version, right. and you loved the song, and I loved the song. It's a great song. And you recorded it, but you... I changed it. I changed <laughs> the song. I put, a, I put my own verse in the middle of it. And, uh, and it came out and the song became a hit. And nobody noticed it? Nobody because knows, nobody, ca nobody cared at that point. If you did it now, uh, I'd be sued. You'd be sued. Oh, yes. Rude, lewd, and, and, everything. and everything else, man. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So um, then you guys, um, you recorded the records, and then what yeah. happened? We recorded the record, and then, you know, we went on still fighting. You know, fighting and all bit. And one night, um, a guy came running up and says, "Your record is on. The Serenaders is on the radio." We ran home with Mom, Mom, Mama. You know, the uh, our record's playing. And then this this jockey was playing. Never let me go. And uh, he says, "This is a local group from North. Uh, so great, so good. We got to play it again." And they played the record again. The record took off. And it was now chock full of hits was a small little label and then it eventually got picked up by MGM. Yes. Right? Right, right. So when the song was being played on the radio, was it on MGM at this point? It was, was it? on MGM. I mean on, on uh chock full of hits. Mm -hmm. And then later on I went to go and buy a record. And when I bought the record, it was on another label. I didn't have a clue. 
Why? But the record was selling, so then he sold it to MGM. Right. So then, um, then, then uh, the American Bandstand thing. Is no. that when that happened? No, no, that that's not when it happened. After that, then uh, it must have been about four months. Alan Savard wanted us to come back in and do another record. I said, do, "Don't we get paid uh, something for that? You know, for the record?" He says, "No, records." It's just promotion for you guys. You get paid when you go and perform on, you know, on the road. On the road. See, you don't get paid for promotion. Then Howard Curry says, you know, that sounds good to me. And I told Howard, I said, Howard, anything sounds good to you <laughs> as long as you are uh, uh, jumping up and down on the stage. I said, that doesn't sound right to me. Right. I said, I think that we should get some money. Because the record is selling. I said, but okay. So the guy says, you got any more records? I said, songs? I said, yes. So that's when I did Give Me a Girl. Give Me a Girl? Yeah. Okay. And um, once that record started to sell, I got drafted in the army. You got drafted. And you went down to where? I South down Carolina? To South Carolina. Yes, right. I went to South Carolina. And you went through boot camp? Correct. And all that stuff. And then? Yeah, when I got there, um, we were in this tent. And they were all white guys. It's only me and, and my friend from up north. Uh, we were there, and uh, this other music was playing. This guy had never been down south, so he, he didn't have a clue about really what was going on. Uh, down in the south. So he asked the guy, the guy says, look, the guy was playing this country at Western music. Hey, look, man, can't you turn that stuff off? Let's listen to some music. You know, that, that that's not music. And then those guys started after us. And then my friend, uh, Snow, he stopped and said, look, we have to stay here and we got to uh, tolerate each other. He says, let's get along. He says, um, because we are in this thing and we got to, we, we got to stay together. So he stopped us from fighting. And then one night, uh, Snow came to me and he told me, he says, look, I want you to know, come, come to the bathroom with me, George. I said, I want to show you something. So he said, look, I want you to go to the PX, and I want you to buy some Kotex. So I said, what? He said, yeah, I'll explain to you later what this is all about. I would want an explanation right then and there, bro. No, but I listened to him. <laughs> and me and my friend, we went to the PX. That's the place where you can go and buy things. Right. And we bought these Kotex that he was talking about. So then after we bought them, then Snow took us back into the bathroom. He says, now look, our sergeant told us to get Kotex for our arms and our knees because we said, going on bivouac, we're going to be crawling on the ground. He said, but don't tell them niggas nothing about it. So he told me about it. So you put them on your elbows, underneath your, uni your, your uh, uniform, and, uh, and on your knees. And he would keep us abreast of anything that was going on, in and everything that was going on. It was segregated down there, really bad. And uh, one day my, my, my mother called me and says, George, the group is going to be on American bandstand. And you were in the Army? I was in the Army then. So you had no control? No control or nothing on me. So I told my captain, I told everybody, and then I was a I was a big shot of the base. Oh, George is gonna be on his group is gonna be on the American bandstand. That must have you must have felt frustrated that you couldn't have been there with the group. Oh right? yes, I did, but I was happy. Yeah. You know, so then at the time they were supposed to be on there, they were late. And they put a Mickey Mouse thing on in their spot, a little Mickey Mouse thing. 
So the guys and stuff turned on me. Then we were kids. We were kids, and they started to say, call, used to call me Mick because where I was supposed to be on, my group was supposed to be on, it was a Mickey Mouse thing. So they made fun of me and the whole bit. So my group missed the big opportunity that I had given them. Because they were late. They were late. And they were chronic. They were chronically late. Late all, all the, the time. time. Yes. Even, even for like the chance of a lifetime. That is right. Everywhere I took them, they were always late. And if you were there, they, you, you would have been there on oh, time. Oh, yeah, of course. Of Absolutely. Course. So that must have really pissed you off, right? Yes, it did. So, wow. After that. When I came out, yeah. You I said, I said, that group. That's it. Forget about it. I'm never going to do anything with them anymore. And then I was washing my car, and um, Sydney Barnes. This is when you first out. met Sydney Barnes. Yeah, yeah. I had met, met Sydney, and you know we were talking and all, and I says that um, I'm going to get another group together, and uh, we got Timothy. I got Howard Curry. And uh, Howard was the only one from the Howard, old group. He's the only one that I took from the old and my, group. And, and my buddy, Timothy Wilson, Timothy rest Wilson. in peace, Timmy, man. Right. Everybody oh. misses Timmy, man. Oh, yeah, Ruthie, man. I loved him. Yeah. Great, Good, great singer, man. Yeah. Yeah. Tiny Tim right. in the Hits. That's right. One right? of the best. Wedding yes. bells, man. That is right. He did that after, obviously, Correct. after yeah. uh, the Serenaders, right? Right, right. Yeah. So you met Sydney, and? And we got together and we formed this group. Uh, the New Serenaders. The New Serenaders. And then um, that's during that time, I, um, we read in the paper of that, that uh, Motown had moved to, uh, to the, uh, New York. What about the Imperials? The Imperials, was that? Was, that was before. Wait, Isn't that was before? That the, was that the Imperials? Yeah. Wasn't the Imperials first? Yeah, the Imperials were first. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm oh. I'm telling this guy about his life, You're, man. That's right. Do you that remember that right. Sydney came over to you? That's right. Sydney came and said. And, and said he was going down. Correct. There was an audition. You must have, you must have, must have read I read book. the whole book in 10 minutes. Man. Oh, I was, oh, okay. I was, I was fascinated, man. That but, is right. You know, there's so much more that I'm not talking about that's in the book because, you know, you guys got to go out and buy the book, man. It's an absolutely fascinating uh, journey that George had. So you, you became friends with Sydney. Yes, Sydney. Sydney came to you and said, I'm going down to audition because yeah. little Anthony had left, the, left the group. Right. And he was going down to audition for the lead. Right. So we, so we went down and a lot of other guys was there and everything in Sydney. And it came down to me and Sydney. And um, Richard wanted me. Richard, you mean Richard, yeah, Richard Barrett. Barrett? Richard, yeah. the famous producer, Richard Barrett, who did the Chantels and the Valentines Correct. and everybody else. Right. He was in so, charge of the audition. The, right, right. So um, I, I won out over, over uh, Sydney, but I told Sydney later on. Sydney was mad. Well, he was a little pissed, but I don't even want to hear. Because yeah. it was his idea to go down, correct? and you beat him out, yeah. and you beat him out because? The only reason I beat Sydney out, Sydney could sing rings around me, okay? But I knew I was going to beat Sydney out because uh, Richard Barrett could only play in one key, and the key that Richard Barrett was playing in was my key. It was out of Sydney's <laughs> range. Sydney could sing rings around me. You know, I, I can't compete with Sydney. So, so that was another kind of divine intervention. Right. That right. he could only play in that one key, and the key happened to be yours. It happened to be my key. And That's how Sydney I just slunk away and... Was, right, and he started to do his own thing. He, he did his own thing. All right. And, and, and then what I did, uh, uh, then I found that, um, that uh, Motown was opening up a... a a New York office. You read in Jet, in Magazine, Jet Magazine. Correct. That New York was opening a New York office. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I went and got Sydney back, you know, and uh, Howard Curry and myself and Timothy Wilson. My man. Those me. were 
the second set of serenaders that we went to audition. I had called and the lady that was going to audition us was Ray Gordy. And you were excited about York. that. You I knew, was really excited. You knew who she was and you, you went back and told your mother. You, oh, yeah. We're going to audition. We're going to audition for Barry Gordy's wife. That's right. Correct. Man, you really read my book. <laughs> and we went and um, we went into this room and there was a little guy with a with a newspaper. This is in the New York office. In the New York office. We auditioned and for uh, Barry, uh, so um, it's, it's the new serenade. The new serenade. You've been there with Ray Gordy, correct? And some guys sitting in a chair, right? And we sang uh, these songs, "If Your Heart Says Yes," and three or four other songs. So after we finished, Ray Gordy turned to this guy that was sitting down and says, uh, "Barry, I like him." And we realized that was Barry Gordy. He was hard, His face was behind the newspaper. Behind the newspaper. And you had no idea. No. And Barry Gordy said, I didn't want you to know it was me because you might have been nervous. Correct. Correct. Right? Correct. So he, he was slick. He was very slick. And, you know, I mean, it wasn't your place to say anything. Like, who's this guy? I'm, right. You just, I almost fainted. <laughs> All of us, we almost fainted. We were in the room. And with we Barry Gordy. Barry, with Barry Gordy. And Ray Gordy says, uh, Barry, I like him. She says, uh, who wrote the songs? I say, I, I, I wrote the songs. So you sang, you sang, If Your Heart Says Yes. Correct. And the flip side, I'll Cry Tomorrow. I'll Cry Tomorrow. Right? Yeah. And you wrote, did you write your, if yeah. your Heart Says Yes too? Yes. You yes. wrote them all? Yeah. Yeah. With Sydney. With Sydney. Yeah. To get, that was a double, 40, double killer 45. That is man. right. So they loved us, right? They loved us. and. Um, make a long story short, they signed us as songwriters, Sydney and I, and then they flew us to Detroit to record those songs. So we did um, If Your Heart Says Yes and I'll Be Sweeter Tomorrow in Detroit, in the studio in Detroit. One second. I will, Cassandra, I will tell you the name of the book, okay? We'll leave that to, towards the end. I'll show it to you and... Uh... Everything's going to be copacetic. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so we went to Detroit. And um, while we, we, they had put us up, and Sydney and I, we went to the studio. And we went upstairs in a little room. You were in the Motown? It was at Motown during that time. So were you in studio? On the book, you'll, right, you'll be able to see, see us on the airplane. I know, I saw the picture, there, yeah. Right. And you were in the studio. We were in the studio. The studio, Studio A. That's right. Where, where Motown cranked out all these big heads. That's where we were. And when you walked in, there was nothing. It wasn't like really professional looking, right? No. There no. were wires, wires all over the place. All over the place. And uh, okay, go ahead. And uh, Sydney and I, uh, the, the group, we went upstairs in a in a room, you know, just where, where they had pianos, they had little pianos and everything. And this little kid came in the room and we didn't say anything. And he went right over to the piano. We didn't say nothing. And he sat down and uh, he started playing the piano. We still didn't say anything. And I don't know to this day how he did it. He turned around and he says, are you those guys from New York that, that, that Miss Ray brought down to record? We almost had a it was Stevie Wonder. Little Stevie Wonder. Little Stevie Wonder. He was a little kid. And he was walking around without any help? He was walking help? around, no help, all over the place. And then he got up and he laughed. And then he walked out of the studio. I mean, out of the, uh, the room. He was, he was like from Jump Street, Motown family. That's right. Little Stevie. And little Stevie was there. During that time when we came down there to record. And then we went in the main room and, man, we recorded. Uh, those songs, man. You're talking about some. We got pictures of it in, in the book. book. In the book, correct. So you, they cut one. They cut one forty-five, right? Right. If your heart says yes, and I'll cry tomorrow correct. on the VIP label. Yes. Which is a Motown subsidiary. Correct. All right. And uh, so, what happened after that? Well, after we recorded, then we came back to New York, and um, Ray Gordy says, 
we're going to be doing demonstration records. Y'all writing, and we're going to do demonstration records to send back to Detroit. To Detroit. But we need a band. Uh-oh. So, and who is the band? So this guy by the name of um, the guy that Eddie Singleton that she later married. You want to talk about Eddie Singleton or no? Well, you could talk about Eddie. Well, Eddie Eddie uh, Singleton. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you guys out there know who uh, Eddie Sing Eddie Singleton is. Uh, he had his own label, I believe. Uh, was oh his, yeah, was his label? Well, no, uh, but during during that time, he had masters, and uh, yeah. he came up with some masters. To, to, but I think he eventually yeah. had the Shrine label. Was that oh, his yeah, label? Had, yeah, that's when he married uh, Ray Gordy. He made he married Ray Gordy, and uh, he started the Shrine label, which Correct. was really no big deal at the time. And now all those Shrine forty fives are worth thousands of dollars. That's what they're saying. Northern Soul stuff on Shrine is worth a fortune, an know. absolute fortune. That's yeah. Great. And uh, what happened was is that Eddie Singleton was having an affair. Right. Well, it's it's in it, it's, it's in the book. It's in, it's it's in not only my book, it's in Ray's book, and it's you know it's, it's it's common knowledge that they were having an affair. They were having an affair, which led to. Well, we were at first we were getting paid um, through the, um, the Joe Bet checks and all. Joe Bet. Joe Bet. You know, it's just the publishing company. Promotion. Right. And then later on, I found out that we, we started getting paid by cash. I didn't know why. This is all in Ray Gordy's book, you know, it's, it's just, they tell it. And all I know is that um, one day, it's like in February, very cold, two gangsters came up into the office where we were working. And they said, um, as of right now, this office is officially closed. <laughs> um, everybody here is fired. Write your name and your address and your telephone number on your belongings because you're not taking anything out of here but your coat. So they threw every, everybody And you out. guys... We had... Uh, at you knew time, who they were, right? Of course. They, they, were, they were gangsters. They were gangsters. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, they uh, and we had appointments. People were there and everything. They run the people out, and uh, then ran ran everybody out. And then they say, "Wait a minute, hold on." Say, "Who's George Kerr? Who's George Kerr?" I said, "I was scared to death. I swallowed two or three times." <laughs> and they say, uh, "I say I'm George Kerr." And then they say, and I'm quoting what they told me. They say, I don't know why Barry want to talk to you. You look more like a hoodlum than all the rest of them. <laughs> and I was scared to death. Then he made a phone call. After everybody, no one was there but me at that time. And those two guys, and they, and they called back and spoke to Rebecca Giles. Uh, Who was Barry's personal secretary. Right. And uh, says, um, Hold on one second. And then they hand me the phone and it was uh, Mr. Gordy on the other end of the line. And he says, how you doing, George? I said, I don't know. I swallowed a couple of times. <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you to Rebecca Giles and she's going to give you some information and uh, you just follow her instructions. So I got on the phone with Rebecca. She says, George, I'm going to call you back with some airline information and you i want you to come to D detroit from there you and so just they you. flew me yeah just me what's no sydney was there. gone everybody was gone everybody was fired out of there yeah so and this is obviously was under the instruction of barry gordy who, who else could close the office because well they find out that that Ray Gordy and um, and uh, Eddie Singleton was bootlegging my guy. By Mary Wells. By Mary Wells. They were bootlegging. And they knew that I didn't have anything to do with it because they had, I was under surveillance. We all was under surveillance. Took us home and brought us back. So they knew that I had 
didn't have anything to do with it. So that's why they shut the New York office. Well, they shut it down. Shut it down. Yeah, that's. that's and they was uh, and was Ray still married to to Barry at the time? No, they had they had separated. They had separated at that time. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. But she was she was running the New York office at that time. Yeah. Okay. So then they brought you out to Motown. Yeah. So, so uh, I got the instructions and I got on the airplane. And there's pictures of you in the book sitting in your office in Motown. Yeah. Writing songs. Yeah. These are pictures. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've never, I never saw those pictures. Right, right. The pictures that are in the book I've never seen. And I've seen a lot of pictures. Right. So it was very cool to see all you guys uh, back in the day standing in front of the Motown, famous Motown building, right? Correct. And there's Timothy with a big pompadour. Right. Right? Looking yes. young and good looking. Yeah. And, and all yeah. you guys, man. Oh, yeah. And that's a picture that I have never seen on the internet before. No, it doesn't. Never. Yeah. And you can only get it if you buy the book. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Great, great pictures. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, so it was great. I mean, um, I have to say, I, when I, and when I went to Detroit and um, they introduced me, you know, I was sitting down there with all the guys. But before I went to Detroit, um, I was waiting, you know, to um, be, to go to Detroit. And, and, and um, uh, what's the name? Uh, Rebecca Giles called me and said that uh, Mr. Gordy wanted me to put, uh, What's his name? Marvin Gaye's voice on, on these um, tracks. Uh, what was it? Uh, back on Broadway, I think. When it, Hello Broadway. Hello Broadway. That was Marvin's album, Hello Broadway, where he did all Broadway tunes. Right. And you wound up producing the album. So I produced Marvin's voice on there, and. Uh, and when he told you that, you said, "Wow." I, I could. Marvin I could, Gaye. Gaye. I said Marvin Gaye. Says, all I had done was demonstration records right. at that time. But uh, uh, Marvin told the, uh, Barry, he says, what, you, what, that New York niggas that do demonstration records, you you going to let him put my voice on? Barry said, you know, he know how to produce voices, even though I had just done demonstration records to send back to Detroit. He knew. So uh, when, when uh, Marvin came up, he came up with bodyguards and later on his arms. And we went to this this uh, studio and I went over there and they had shipped up the, the tapes and they wanted me to put his vocals on. I thought that was a lot of confidence that yes. they had uh, uh, in me. Which we, is a mind blower because one minute you're washing your car in Newark it's crazy. <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, this is an amazing story, guys. One minute he's washing his car in Newark, and the next minute he's in the Motown studios producing a Marvin Gaye album. That's crazy. That's well, crazy. Well, anyway, he wasn't we, we, we were, uh, in the New York, in a New York studio uh, producing them. They had sent the tapes up because he was right, up there. Right, 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 right. He was up there because they were going into He was Copa. playing at the Copa. Right. So okay. when I went in and after we finished and I was putting the songs on, one of the songs that uh, Marvin started scatting on in the front, and I told him, don't, don't do it, you know what I mean? But put just Let me guess what song it was. Let me guess what song it was. Days of Wine and Roses. Correct. You, you read it. No. You did you, you told me years ago. Oh, yeah. Years and years and years ago when we first got to know each oh, other. Yeah, right. And you told me uh, that you were at Motown and... Um, you told me that you had produced, I had mentioned The Days of Wine and Roses, which is a song I love, All right, I you know, too. from the movie, Henry Mancini, the whole thing, Correct. you know, and uh, when I heard Marvin sing it, because he was a balladeer, yes. you, know, you know, but not yet, but he could sing a ballad. Oh, yeah, right. So right. We, we did it, it, you know, so uh, after we finished doing all of the, uh, the, the, the voiceover dubs, uh, Marvin said, he says, George, he says, oh, look, man, he said, Barry was right. He said, I told Barry, that's what he told me. Uh, he says, uh, uh, Barry said he, 
I was you was gonna put my voice on and I said who that New York nigga that ain't they done nothing but demonstration records he said I gotta say Barry knew what he was talking about he said you did a good job and he said for that your wife there's going to be two tickets for you and your wife on the front row to be able to see me open it uh, in, in the Copa. At the Copa. Yeah. And back then, there was a lot of Motown artists. Sing, well, the big artists. Oh, like, yeah. I remember I went to see the Supremes at the Copa. Right. It was like 1968 or something like that. Correct. And I, I really didn't enjoy the show because it was more, they did medleys. Right. You know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. They didn't, I think they sang one song all the way through. Other than that, it was just like a kind of a Broadway show where they just did medleys of their hits. Right. You know, I right. guess they were only allotted a certain time and, and Probably or so. whatever. But I, I really didn't enjoy it. I mean, I enjoyed seeing them live and everything like that. But right. So you were front and center for Marvin Gaye at the Copa. Correct. Me and my way. Wow. Incredible. Absolutely. And Marvin had told you when uh, he finally decided to let you do it, he said, if this fails, it's on you. Yeah, he, no, he, they told, he told uh, Mr. Gordy, he says, look, if, if I don't come off, it's, it's on you. I think they, they were saying, smoking them, they were so busy doing some things and they needed somebody. And he said, me. So I had done, Sidney Barnes and I had done over 300 songs for, uh, on demonstration records to send to D Detroit. But the writers, you know, and uh, so, so Mr. Gordy knew that I knew what I was doing, putting those vocals on, on cause I was really producing back and then. And he was impressed and- and he was very And impressed. Ray Gordy was impressed. Yes. And they, they mentioned something about $60,000. Yeah, they spent a lot of money. They spent uh, 60 the demonstration. grand. Yeah. Uh, 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 we did so many demonstration records, me and Sidney Barnes, it was crazy. And if it, I don't think, I think the reason why they didn't release our stuff in a whole bit was because of the problems that we had in New York City. And I could understand it. You know, I really could understand it. Yeah. The guys in Detroit were very uh Oh. When I went to Det when Barry moved me to to Detroit, man, I went in, went there with all the producers there and all of them. Barry bought you got you a house? Got me a home. Right, me and my my family moved me. You moved that your family to Detroit. To Detroit, got, got you a, house. a house and a car. And a car. And I had done nothing but demonstration records during that Incredible. time. Incredible. He called Absolutely. me a diamond in the rough. He Absolutely. he knew that I was going to be somebody, you know, before I did anything. So he told me to come. In, you come here and you learn. And during that particular time. When I was trying to get into the studio, uh, Lucy Wakefield Gordy, who was in charge of the publishing company, Joe Bett at the time, she saw how energetic I was and she took a liking to me and she put me under her wing and she said, I'm going to teach you publishing. She taught me about publishing and it's a good thing she taught me about publishing because after I left Motown and started to produce records, all of the hit records that I produced, they didn't pay us nothing. My publishing company, because I wrote all those songs and I produced the records and all, that's how I was able to survive this whole thing. Because the record companies back there during that time did not pay the artists or the writers. Wow. And the producers. Not, and it, it was no black or white thing. They wasn't paying the black artists and they was not playing, uh, paying the white artists. So these guys were doing it just to be able to maybe get a chance to work for, um, to be successful. Right. Have so, one of their songs accepted. Or yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So, so they I'm worked for saying, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, you know, we were cutting hit records and all. But those record companies, large and small, was not paying. But if, if it's a good thing that Lucy Wakefield taught me about publishing, because I formed my own publishing company, and, I, and, I, and then a writers, and that's what taking care of me today, to this day, my songwriting and my publishing. All those songs that I produced, the majority of the songs that I produced had hits all over the world. Uh, 
I got 25% of what I was supposed to get. 75% was never paid to, to me. You understand? I, I've had enough hit records to be filthy rich, you know, but they did not pay us back there during that time. Paying your dues, man. That's right. That's what it right. Paying your dues. Correct. What was the name of your publishing company? The name of my publishing company is named after my wife, Wesselin Music. That's my publishing company, which is known all over the world. I have 455 songs that I that I've written, and I got over 300 songs that I publish. That's what saved me, it made me be able to, uh, you know, take care of my family and everything was the publishing. And I thank God for Miss Lucy Wakefield Gordy for what she did. And she liked me so much. So when she, when she died, Barry Gordy, I was one of the, the first pallbearers, uh, you know, uh, under the casket, Smokey and a few others. But I was number one Paul Bear. She liked me. And before she before she died on the operating table, she uh, told them to give me a raise in salary. So I'll always be indebted to Miss Lucy Wakefield Gordy. So at every step of the way, you lucked out somehow, some way. Yes. In yes. every rung that you climbed, right, you lucked out. Correct. Richard Barrett could only play in one key. Lucy <laughs> Wakefield took a liking to you and taught you publishing. So, see, this this is how people make it, man. You can't just make it like that. You know, Correct. there's a certain amount of luck involved. That's right. And you had you had divine intervention every step of the way, man. Yes, That's absolutely incredible. So you. One part of the book that I like is that you were um, go to these production meetings at Motown. Yes. And you find yourself sitting at the same table with Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye and Holland Dozier Holland. Correct. And all these people. And George. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> sitting in there and everything. And I remember the first day at, at the, um, the meetings and every, the production meetings, uh, Mickey Stevenson, who was the A&R director at the time, said uh, we have a new arrival uh, here uh, from Mo uh, from uh, uh, New York City, from the New York office. And all the guys, they looked at me, you know, uh, as to say, you know, what is this doing here, you know? And he says, George, stand up, you know, this is George Kerr and everything. And they looked at me like, I'm, you know, what am I, what, you, what are he doing? And what did Barry bring him here? They were territorial. Yes, that's what they were. But I remember in one of the meetings, uh, I was always very, very, I was, my mind was like a sponge during that time. I soaked up everything that was going on. So I remember Barry Gordy saying in one of the meetings, he says, look, uh, we are going to now re uh, re start to release albums. And if we have a hit, if a hit, if a song breaks out of the album, we're not going to take that song out of the album to, to make a single out of it because I'd rather sell a $2, two, a two dollar item than a 45 cents item. And I'm listening. So once I left Detroit and went on my own, uh, The Temptation had a record that was breaking out of the um, their album and the name of the song was message from a black man so a light bulb went off in my head and i had gone down and was listening to this little group and they were singing the song identical to the temps so a light bulb went off in my head i said i want to record that group what you going to record them on message from a black man it's a temptation that's a year took them to new york recorded them on Message from a black man, put it out there with the whatnots. And my record is the one that gets sampled all the time. And my song became a hit. We sold 500,000 copies. Where'd you find the whatnots? Were they in uh, Detroit? No, they weren't in Detroit. They were in, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. But I'm just saying, 
I heard Barry say that he would never take a, a song out. And I know kids could not afford $2. So I said, I'll get the crumbs. <laughs> so the crumbs turned out to be the, uh, over 400 and some thousand records sold on Message from a Black Man and the Whatnots. So, you know, so I was always keeping my mind on what was going on. So that song made the Whatnots. Was that the first hit? The very first hit. What about I'll Race Away Your Pain? That came later. That one came later. Was that one of your songs? Yeah, I wrote it on an airplane about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> I wish I could write a song like that in 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> you also wrote, um, you told me years ago, you wrote Look Over Your Shoulder in like 10, 15 oh, yeah. minutes or something like yeah. that. Well, songs, you know, writing songs is the easiest thing in the world. I, I say everybody should be able to write a song. Well, that's your gift. Believe me, back in the days of the early 70s, I yeah, was okay. playing guitar and stuff like that. I tried to write a song. Forget it, man. <laughs> Forget it. You really don't know how hard it is to come up with something like that. You well, know, but so when, easy but when you, Yeah, but when you have that talent, then yeah. you turn into someone like Carol King or Neil oh, Sedaka. Yeah. Oh, yes. Or, you know, you could just pump them out like crazy. Right. You right. know, like uh, back in back in the 40s, and uh, you had guys like Irving Berlin and, and uh, all those guys, right, and Cole right. Porter, just pumping out American standards one after another. Right. One after another. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, I have a lot of respect for that because I'm a pretty decent guitar player. I, I can't write a song, man. No? Yeah, what am I going to say? You know, I tried, I tried, well, but I know, just couldn't uh, do it. You know, then you got guys like you and um, uh, what's his name, uh, Lionel Richie, who writes writes songs in the shower. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a part of us. He turns on the shower, yeah. and all these songs come out of the mm -hmm. nozzle. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. All right. So now you're in Motown, and you're you're um, waiting to produce. And they're telling you, be patient. Right, right. Your time will come. Yeah. You know, and everyone there is telling you, be patient. Right. Right. And then you got to the point where you were starting to get impatient. Correct. And then that's when I went over to Golden World. And, and uh, Golden World Records. Right. And uh, um, uh, what's his name? Edwin Starr was recording. So I, I had written a song and I produced this song. On Edwin Starr. Um, now, 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 the people at Motown yeah. told you you cannot be involved. Oh, oh that's a no-no. With the people at Golden, it was a, it was a, a Motown subsidiary, okay. right? No, it wasn't a Motown subsidiary. No, Ed Wingate. Ed Wingate. Okay. On uh, that, you know, Golden World, mm -hmm. and he was a rival. They, 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 they were, were rivals, rivals. Yeah. Golden World and Motown, and yeah. they told you. Under no circumstances, oh, yeah. be involved with anybody from Golden. That's Gold. right. That was that was no no. And so after you waited and waited and waited and waited, you went over to Golden. I Gold. went over there, you know, on, at night and produced the song and used my wife's maiden name on the song. Right, and and, and if, if and if you notice on there is W. Hobson, but no producer on it. Right. But I produced it. And I used the uh, Dantes, who did all the backgrounds and stuff with Motown. I used all the Motown musicians. And I used Paul Reiser as the, as the arranger. And they never knew. Did they know? Like Barry or? No, no, no not that I know of. Nobody knew. Nobody said you that. You were using Barry's musicians. And you are using the Andantes, who were, were actually the real Supremes. That's <laughs> Right? You said it, not me. Right? The, the, Diana, they sang behind Diana and did all the in-studio in vocals. Yeah, and did. then the girls went out on tour because the Andantes weren't exactly uh, oil paintings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right? uh, I think right? you know what you're talking but about. But they can sing. Yeah, yeah, or they can really sing. They, they were Like angels. They were phenomenal singers. Cool. They came right from the church. Correct. Right? Yes. And uh, so you used, you used Barry's singers and, and Barry's uh, musicians. Yes. And you produced the, uh, I'll have, I have faith in you, baby. Correct. 
which and wound up being the flip side of SOS. Correct. Where Edwin Starr. Correct. And that's what lit the rocket. That's that's that's, right. that's where the rocket ship started that's to take first, off. Right. That's the first record that I produced. But you didn't use your name. Couldn't use. You couldn't use your name because you were under contract to Motown. Right. And then when did you go to uh, Berry and say, I want out? Well, after a while, after Miss Wakefield passed, because I used to lean on her in the whole bit. After she passed, I went to uh, Mr. Gordon and asked him for a release. And, uh, and he was still he telling you to be patient. Yeah, they were Your time will come. Patient. He had yeah. no idea what you'd already done. No. So I left. And I came. And I went and then told my wife that uh, I had heard about this this guy in Baltimore, Maryland, a disc jockey, he was having all these different shows and all. I said, we'll go down there. And you see, didn't know him? No, I didn't know him from a can of beans, you know. So I went down and um, I, I, I knew what he looked like. I saw the pictures of him. He was him still living in Detroit? No, I was back. You, you moved back to New York. Back to New Jersey. New then. Jersey, right. And I told my wife, I was so, I said, I'm going to go down here and get this guy to give me some money to produce these records. That's the kind of confidence I had. Never saw this guy. And so he was at? He was at WEBB. Correct. His name was Rockin' Robin. Right. And you asked him for a grant. That's right. I said, look, I, I went down and looked him in his eyes, and I said, look, I say, I'm a record producer. I say, I just left Motown, and I was working at Motown as a songwriter and all And he that. doubted you. Yeah. I looked him in the eye and I, you know, I says, uh, but I learned and I say, I know how to produce records and everything. I said, but if you give me a thousand dollars, I'll go back to New, New Jersey and uh, produce a hit record for you uh, and I. And I said, I split everything down the middle with you. He looked at me like I was crazy. He said, what did you do at Motown? I said, well, I wrote songs and all. He says, well, why did you leave Motown? If, you know, I said, well, I want to go on my own. He said, well, what did you do? I said, I did that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, I Have Faith in You by Edwin Starr. He said, wait just a minute. I got this record. He looked at it and everything. He says, I don't see your name on here. He said, you, George Christ. Yeah. So see, W. Hobson. I said, that's my wife's maiden name. He looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> I would have too. And then I looked him in his eye, and this is what I told him. I said, look at my eyes. I said, now, what do you see? He said, I see a little black nigga uh, trying to con me out of $1,000. I said, no, <laughs> so that's not what you see. I said, what you see is a very confident person that know what he's talking about. And that I can make you and I some money. Make a long story short, he took me around uh, uh, to this to this restaurant. And wait, 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 before that, you had gone there to see him, and he wouldn't see you. Oh yeah, he wouldn't see you. Correct. You went and told, spoke to the secretary, and yeah. said, "I'm here to see uh, Rock and Robin." You're right. right. And he said, well, "He's busy. He's not going to see you." So you waited for him outside the studio. Yes, but, but right? I, I can't tell them everything. They got to buy the book. Oh, there's still plenty. There's plenty, <laughs> man. There's plenty we're not talking about. Oh, yeah. All right. But, so. but, but, but it went great, to, to, you know, and to make, a, to make a long story short, he took me to his home. He fed me, put me up for a night, and gave me $1,000, and I came back to New, New Jersey and recorded Hypnotize. The thousand cost me a thousand dollars to do hypnotize. Now, tell everybody how you came to meet Linda. Oh, after I had produced hypnotize, I, I, I was producing the record and I was using the Poindexter brothers. Uh, Girlfriend. Well, you had known the Poindexter brothers, right? Yeah. And they had the song hypnotize. Right. You were in the studio with them. Yeah. And so I went and I produced the record, and I used that to let her sing on the record. 
but she was not who I was going to use. She was one of the Poindexter's girlfriends. See, right, that that she she used to sing all the the girl songs that the Poindexter brothers wrote, and they would sing all the guys. Songs. How did you meet them? They came and they knew I had I had been uh, with Motown in the New York office, and they auditioned some songs for me. And I listened to them. No, 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 I don't want that one. No, I want this one. No, 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 no. I love want that one. I, I like that song. I'll be sweeter tomorrow. Uh, hypnotized. They played. They had played hypnotized to everybody, and everybody turned it down. All that stuff. But I could hear. So I picked that one, and I picked about four songs. And since she was auditioning the song, we had her voice on the on hypnotized track. So when I took it home. I says, the song is a hit. I say, but I got to get a voice on it that's going to walk water. So I called Jerry Harris. I knew him. I said, Jerry, I need someone that can walk water because I got a hit song. He's, I got the MF. He's, he just, he's a, cuff, a cusser. He said, I got the MF for you. And he took me to uh, his house his house and linda jones came called linda to come over and she came over there she came in cursing cursing linda had one of the, the nastiest mouths you ever seen in your life she and jerry just cussed out each other and then that's laughing the whole right day. but i played it for her and she got a little pencil and paper and started scribbling it down and the minute that she started to sing it Shield bumps came up and down my arms. I said, Jerry, that's it. I said, that's it. I called up Pat Jacks and told him the next day I want to go in the studio. And I went to the studio and recorded it. But as Linda was running it down, I told the guy, hit the, hit the button. She thought she was just running it down because she was reading. She did the song all the way down. She says, okay, George, I'm ready. I said, no, 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 you're not ready. I said, it's all over with. She said, what do you mean, MF? <laughs> she says, I got to do it again. She said, because I was mispronouncing the word hypnotize. I was saying hypnotize. I said, but it's going to stay like that. She cursed me out, cursed me out, but I will not <laughs> change it. But a lot of people don't know Linda is saying hypnotize right. all right. through the song. But I wouldn't change it because I had goose pimples on my arms. And after I recorded it, I walked for two and a half years. Nobody wanted the record. Nobody wanted. No one heard that record. They say, ain't you got something like Motown? I said, but you already got Motown. Ain't you got something like Motown? Nobody heard it. So after walking with that record for two and a half years, I was up on Broadway, 53rd and Broadway, when I looked up in the air and I said, George, there's no way in the world everybody could be wrong and you be right. So that day, I lost faith in hypnotize. I couldn't even give the record away. Then I myself, who really believed in the record, said it's not a hit. And I was looking up in there and it was raining. And something said, go ahead and cry. So I was walking down Broadway. I had already given up knowing that I could not be right and everybody wrong. And this song by Nat King Cole, Smile, came to me. And the words, as I was walking down, I could hear him singing, Smile, though your heart is aching. Written by Charlie Chaplin. Smile, even though it's breaking. Although a tear, I was crying, may be all uh, oh so near. Smile through your tears and sorrow. Smile. And maybe tomorrow you find the sun come shining through. I had given up and I got on the bus 
and I had given up. And then Lucy Wakefield, Gordy, came to me and said, I know you're not a quitter. Just like that. And when I went home, I got back on the bus and came back to New York. And that's when I was able to get the record placed. And as they can say, when I got that record uh, placed by Warner Brothers with Jerry Rockaboy, that I played it for. Right. You played it for Ronnie Mosley. Ronnie Mosley. And, and he didn't like it. And he didn't like it. He was turning it down. And Jerry Ragavoy was walking down the hall. That's right. And he heard it, and he said, that's a hit. That's what he said. And he said, what you want for it? I said, $1,000 and a 7% deal. That's what he was giving back that during that time. He said, you got it. Where's the master? I went and got the master and brought it back to him. And when I went down, took that $1,000 and went down to uh, 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 Baltimore and gave the $1,000 back to Rockin' Robin, and I told him I got rid of that piece of S. I had lost faith in the record. I thought then, you know, I had gotten rid of it. I had pulled something over on Jerry Rockaboy. So I went to Florida. So what he did, he laughed and everything because he thought it was a miss too when I brought it to him. He said, what did you do with my money? I said, this is a hit. He said, this ain't no hit. He said, the only reason, the only way that this is a hit is if I jump up on it, up and down on it. And he weighed about 300 pounds. So he lost faith in the record. So when I brought him the money back, he gave me half of the money back and we laughed. I went to Florida and came back. Because he didn't expect to get anything. No. He didn't, you know, he, he got he his money you were back. gone forever. Yeah, he thought, right. But when I came back, he, and he listened to what I gave him. And he says, oh, no. You messed up the money. He didn't hear the record either. I said, that's a hit. He said, yeah, if I jumped up and down on it with my fat self. But after three months, I was went to New York and Sammy Turner, you know the guy? Lavender Blue? Correct. Mm -hmm. He asked me, he says, George, where you been, man? That's the way he talked. Jerry Wright was looking for you, man. You got a hit record. That's the way he talked. I said, I got a what? He said, you got a hit record. Three when, months. That's right. Wow. And then when I went over there, he says, where, where have you been? The booking agents is calling. We got a hit. We're selling. Right At that particular time, he says, man, we're selling 2,500 records a day. There's a lot of records back there during that time. He said, we got, we got a smash. Where is she? I said, she's in Jersey. He said, you got to get her. Booking agents is calling us. And that's how. And then, so that that was really, so it really all started with Edwin Starr lit the fuse. Correct. And then Linda just exploded. Correct. And that was it. Yeah. And um, so she was touring, and she got in trouble. Yeah. I was um, when I when Linda was traveling, I was with her, and nobody could go near her. She. You know, because I was there. But then when I started to get, you know, uh, known, and then they wanted me to do the OJs and not everybody, I couldn't travel with her anymore. So that's when she uh, got hooked on the, on, um, the heroin. drugs, heroin, heroin. Yeah. And so meanwhile, you, you, you weren't on the scene because you left to go produce the OJs. Correct. They did uh, I'll Be Sweeter Tomorrow and, and Look Over Your Shoulder. Correct. And then they took off. Right. Right. But meanwhile, uh, but you had, first, you had done Look Over Your Shoulder with the Implements. A lot of people never heard of the Implements, but I thought the, if the Implements would have gotten some promotion, I think the implements could have been a real, real big group because they were young and they could really, really sing and they were like putty. I could mold them any kind of way that I wanted to. And how did you wind up on Phillips Records? 
Well, I just got a deal. You just got a deal from Phillips. And Correct. So they're, 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 you told me about that years ago at Downstairs Records, because yeah. we were talking about that song, and uh, you mentioned, well, they didn't do it first. I said, what you talking about, Willis? Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> what you talking about? And you said, well, this group, The Implements, did it first. So it took me six months, but I found the record. Sure did. And I found now it's now it's worth a couple of hundred bucks, two, three hundred bucks or something like that. That's amazing. Yeah. But um I liked it, but I didn't like it as much as the OJs. Because you know, the OJs were more uh rough edged soul. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. I mean I like the implements. Yes, yeah, right. And the flip side, do you remember the flip side? Um uh, I wish it were me. I wish it could be me. Could be, right? right? And Correct. you also did that with, did you do it with the hesitations? Yes, too? I did. Yes. That's right. And I liked the flip side. I wish it could be me. Yeah. Did you write that? No. No. Poindexter, bro. Poindexter. Killer song, man. Yeah. But when I heard the hesitations do it, that was a whole different yeah, trip. Sure it was. They tore it up. Sure did. Right? Yeah. And that was only an album track. That wasn't, right. that wasn't a 45. That's right. Right? Yeah. So now, you, now you're producing the OJs and you're uh, leaving Linda to the dogs. Right? Not intentionally. But right. She, she wasn't under yes. your supervision anymore. Right, right. And she was starting to get deeper and deeper into drugs. And there was this guy who was a drug dealer who was following her around, right? Yeah. This this guy was following her. She had already been hooked, and it's not only following Linda. He was following the, all the, the the singers. They from city to city. This drug dealer would follow him and give him give him drugs, any type of drugs that they wanted. Right. So, I that she she was performing at the uh, Symphony Hall in New York. So I said. I got to try to save Linda. So I got with Jerry Harris and I said, and we went and this drug dealer was there. So we got him by himself and I said, look, man. Wait, but before that happened, before that happened, <laughs> right? Before that happened, you got a call from Chicago. Uh, you, do, uh, you want to t- t- talk about that? Do you want to talk about it or yeah, no? Well. Well, yeah, no, but if you don't have no, to. but no, yeah, Linda had called me and, and told me this was about 3 30 in the morning, and she had called me and say this guy Jake had hit her in the eye. And she couldn't perform. And she couldn't perform. So I jumped on an airplane the next day with Jerry and we went, we flew to Chicago. And you paid the drug dealer a visit. Oh no, 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 no. That was a no drug deal. You get you got it all. It's, it's, it's two different things. Oh, okay. And this guy that hit her was a guitar player. She was oh, okay. they falling in love with this cat. And he, they had a squabble, and he hit her. And she told me Jake had hit her in the eye. And I got on an airplane, and I flew to Detroit. I mean, uh, flew to Chicago, uh, uh, Chicago, where she were performing. And uh, when I got there, her eye was, all, was sitting out. So I took her to the hospital. And she told me, she says, George, uh, Jake, don't don't hit him. Don't do anything to him. It's, it, was, it was my fault. It was my fault, she kept saying. And then uh, I took her to the hospital, and I took her off the tour. And I told the promoter, you know what I mean? She had some problems and stuff, because she couldn't perform like that. One second, I'm going to interrupt you. My friend. Mrs. Busybody from Amsterdam is listening, Holland, and she says, give the man something to drink. <laughs> okay. Show it. Hold it up, man. Okay? <laughs> what place she's from? She, she's, she lives in Amsterdam, in Amst- Holland. Oh, in Holland? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and she's, she's telling me to give you something to drink. He already had the water. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're... I'm glad you're um, Concerned about George. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> oh, yeah. So so I took her off the tour. And um, and I asked what room J- 
Jake was in. And I told Jerry to bring him down into the um, into the underground uh, garage. And I said, I said, Jake, why did you hit Linda? He said, well, um, she took my drugs. I had already given her some drugs and she took mine. So that's when I hit him and I, I knocked him down. And Jerry kicked him and everything and I grabbed him in the collar and I told him, if I ever catch him in the same city with Linda, that I was going to make him regret the day that he was born. And I made him get his stuff and get out of there. And uh, I, I left Jerry out on the road with Linda, you know, to, to make sure, you know what I mean, that she was going to be cool. Mm -hmm. But at that particular time, you know, she, she was handling it, you know. But then when she left, I was producing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the OJs, and she was opening at the New Wonder Garden in Atlantic City. I said, well, I'll take a ride down. So I took a ride down there, and she tore him up, of course, man. She just, but I noticed she was talking slow. What did she do in her act besides hypnotize? Oh, man, uh, Change is Gonna Come. She did all of them songs, man. Anything that Linda sang. Yeah, well, I know that. You know what I mean? She, she used to sing all these different songs of the songs. Did, did she sing any other songs from the from the album? Oh like, yeah, that's that was. But this was. What first, have I done to make before. you mad? Oh yeah, give my love a try. Of course, she was doing all those oh. in the show. Yes, man, she used to kill them. Boy, I would have loved to have seen that, man. Oh, she wow, was, she was incredible. Wow. Yeah, Linda, Linda was incredible. So then, found out she was hooked. So I took her, and put her in rehab. Cleaned her up, and the whole thing we went back out on tour again. But I still had to, was working with the OJs, you know, in, in the process of doing them. And then other people were calling, you know what I mean? So I couldn't give her as much time, you know, as, it, you right. know, I couldn't, I, you know. Tough situation, man. Correct. Because she was, she was like, uh, well, now you had the OJs who were becoming yeah, right. huge. Yeah. Right. And yeah, there was some other people that was caught. I mean, it was crazy, you know. And then, and then um, Linda just, they, you know, then she, uh, her brother came out on the tour with her, you know, and that was really chaotic because, you know, at that particular time, he was cross dressing, you know, you know, and, you know, he was into the drugs and his boyfriend was into the drugs. So it was crazy. You know, so I had to put her, you know, try to put her back into a rehab. But she, this time she told me she, she wasn't going. She said, uh, I don't need to go. Anymore. And uh, her brother was backing her up in the whole bit, you know, saying, no, I don't. So I said, well, I'm, I'm through with it. So I jumped on an airplane and came home and then I said, well, I, I can't let Linda go this way, you know, I said, so when she came back to the um, symphony hall, I said, well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to kidnap Linda. Uh, that's what I told Jerry, I said, I'm going to kidnap Linda and, and, and get her some help. So I went into this drug dealer that was following them and told him, said, look, man, you got all these other acts here that you can do whatever you want. I said, but Linda is my act. I want to save Linda. I said, look, man, I'm going to give you some money. I want you to help me save Linda. I said, she won't follow me, but she'll follow you. I said, so what I want you to do is tell her, I said, I got a farm in Virginia. I say, and I want to take her. To, you tell her that we're going to have a, a private party with her. She'll go with you. Of course. You know. So we took, I took Linda to Virginia. And when we went into this farm, she looked and saw there wasn't nobody there. But, but uh, I had a doctor and a nurse there. Wow. 
I was paying for all of this stuff myself. And when Linda found out that I had duped her, man, she was cursing me for everything, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I had to, 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 uh, we got the, the, uh, the uh, drug dealer to leave, you know? Wow. And, uh, you know, took him back. And man, all day and all that night, I can, I can imagine. It was crazy. She was going through, I mean, she's throwing everything and calling it. And about five o'clock in the morning, she started to need something, you know. Mm -hmm. But at that time and everything, I'd had the, the doctor had the, the the insulin that she needed. She was diabetic. Yeah, she was diabetic. The, yeah, she was diabetic. Had the insulin, and he had the uh, methadone. The methadone. So we had everything that we needed, you know. And um, she would take the the methadone. So we had to do a lot and everything, you know. So we were down there for about three. Nobody knew where she was. I had kidnapped her. But she was down there and she was still going crazy and stuff and doing different things. And then after about a week and a half, she started to become Linda again. You That's know? what methadone will do to you. Right. It gives you a chance to, it takes the pressure off you not Correct. worrying about being sick right. gives you time to think. Right. And she was taking the insulin and was giving her orange juice and we was feeding her the right way and everything. And then she said, George, I am so glad you did this. Her brother, nobody knew where she was. Everybody, you know, they, they had the cops out looking for her. <laughs> it was crazy. But we was down there, man, and everything. Man. She, then we could open the door. And she could go out for fresh air and everything. And anyway, and if she couldn't get out of there, even if she tried, because we were so far back in there. But we didn't have to keep the door uh, locked or nothing and everything. And man, she began to be Linda again. She said, I'm going to go, I need to go back out on the road. I says, Linda, I says, if we take you back out there, you can't have your brother, which is, oh, no, he's got to be with me. My brother has to be. I said, it's that same, that bad environment. I said, you're going to go back into that same stuff again. She says, no, George, I'll stay, stay away from it, and I'll do this and all. So after about a month and a half, I called Queen's Book and Agent, and, 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 uh, and, and, and I forget the lady's name. I said, Linda is ready to go back on the road. So I got the group, but the, the band and everything back. And we put, put her back out there on the road. And the band, was that Richard T? The, oh, or, no. Or they were just in no. the studio. No, I had, gotten, I had gotten musicians that I, I was paying. They were on salary. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone known? No. Just right. regular old musicians. Right. But, but when you recorded Linda... Uh, you had the most amazing musicians right, ever. Richard right. T. That's right. Eric Gale. Eric Gale. Bernard Purdy. And Pretty Purdy. Pretty, yeah, all of them. And Linda did every song in one take. Every song that I ever done with Linda, she did it in one take. That's amazing. Great singer. Great, great, great. Do you know how, many, you know how much money is spent in studios? Take 55, yeah. take 120. One take, and it was done. That's right. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, a gym in the yeah. studio. I mean, just whether it was an up-tempo tune or a ballad, Linda was one of the greatest that ever done it. So, all right. So, so now she's back on the road again. Right. You call Queens Booking. And yeah, I called Queens uh, Booking, it and, and they booked up. As soon as she was back, man, the, the, the jobs was everywhere. You know what I mean? And um, the night before Linda uh, passed, she did, she told the band after, you know, they had sung everything. And this is something that she, I didn't, she, I didn't know she was gonna do this. She had been singing with this big orchestra, big band and everything. And she turned to everybody and says, look, she said, I know you, first she said, you guys, y'all been playing all day. I know y'all tired. 
she says, so this song right here, just relax. I don't need any, anyone to accompany me. And she took off her shoes and she got in the middle of that song and she started saying, a change is going to come. I had tape, I had a little tape on it. It's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars if I could find it. She sang, a change is going to come. And you never heard anything. So like she knew she wasn't going to be here the next day. Wow. She sang that song and you could hear a pin drop in that place. And it was jam packed. The next day, I mean, I had all our gowns in, in the trunk of my car. She says, I, she says, George, I'm going to stay at the hotel tonight. She was back on her insulin. She was taking her methadone. She was Linda again. And what we did, I took her to the hotel. And I said, I'm going home. I keep your gowns in the car. She said we was going to close at the Apollo the next day. So she says, I'm going to my mom's and you can pick me up at my, at my mom's. So she came to her mom. I took her to, to her hotel. She was going with this guy. I forget what his name was, but this was a, a clean cut guy. And uh, I took her to the hotel and he was there. I left. And she says, come and pick me up at my mom's the next day. I went the next day, Linda went to her mom's and said, mom, that chicken smells good. I'm a little tired. I'm going to lay across the bed. When the first piece of chicken is done, wake me. And when she went to sleep, she went into a diabetic coma. And they rushed her to the hospital and she died. So when I went to pick Linda up, I saw all the people crying and all the people all around there. And I went upstairs and, and I asked the mother, oh, oh, where's Linda? They said, they just, the ambulance just took her to the hospital and the Model Medical Center. And I got in my car and I drove real fast. And the way I found out that Linda had passed, this guy was directing traffic, you know, the bell go this. I says, and I came up there, I says, did anybody bring a, a singer up here and everything? Oh, oh, girl, keep moving. He says, uh, oh, who? Who? That girl, Linda? Oh, yeah, they just quit, they just wheeled her up to the mall. That's how I found out that Linda had passed. So I ran in there and a doctor was there. And that's when I asked him, I says, a, 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 a singer, did they come? They says, who are you? I said, I'm our manager. He says, uh, come, come with me. And then he took me uh, in uh, an office and says, uh, I'm sorry, she, she's deceased. And I say, I got to see her. I says, are, are you uh, a, a next of kin? I says, no, I'm the manager. I said, but I have to know that she is, you know, it, she's deceased because I'm the one that had to tell her mother, you know what I mean, that she's, she's deceased. And that's when they took me down to the place and then they pulled her out. And Linda looked like she would just sleep. And then, you know, they pulled, pulled her back and I went to her, her mother. And I had to tell her mother that Linda had passed. I mean, you're talking, boy, that was something. And, you know, at her funeral, I mean, it, the lines and lines was around that church. Aretha was there? Yeah, Aretha sang. Aretha sang? Yeah. What she, do you remember what she said? No, I can't remember. But it was something. But an artist like Linda Jones, only comes around once in a century. Because Linda is the only artist that on every word she bent 
every word she said that had it, it, the, the word had a meaning. Yeah, you could tell. You know, that's for sure. She was, she was really good, and all over the world, the people loved Linda Jones. You know, but you know, um, she was here. She died at twenty. I think it was twenty six years old. That's too young, man. Yeah, that's too young. Damn shame, man. Yeah. I can imagine what she would have done. Oh, oh. Right? She died with, we, we had, for your precious love. Right. And she wound up on Turbo. Well, um. Because she was with, originally on Loma. Yeah. And Warner Brothers. Yeah. And one, Warner Brothers wasn't, wasn't paying any money in the whole bit, so we left. And you went to Turbo, that was part yeah. of, uh. All platinum. All platinum, Sylvia Robinson. Right. And uh, you did the same songs over again. Well, right. right? A yeah. lot of them. Yes, we did. And the, and the turbo versions yeah. were rougher. Yeah, sure was. There were a lot, you know, she, she was really getting down. Right. On the turbo versions. Correct. Right? Yeah. You just let her loose. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. She's a, a, a monster. Oh, yeah. A monster singer, man. Like you said, once in a lifetime. So after that... Um, what's next? The escorts? Are the escorts next? Well, were you still working with the OJs? You know, I was finished the OJs, and uh, but uh, Linda Jones' brother, I was doing the OJs during the time Linda had. Oh, came so here's me. the connection. Yeah. Here's the connection. Yeah. yeah, Linda came to me, and I was doing the OJs in the studio. She says, George, uh, John, my brother is is singing in a talent show at the um, prison, the Railway State Prison. I want you to go down there with me. Yeah. So I said, uh, okay. I said, I'll go with you. Wait one second. Mm -hmm. We got the Chancellor of Seoul, my, my, my brother, Mike Boone. Uh, how you doing, Mike? Mike says he was there at the Apollo Theater for Linda Jones's last performance in March 1972 for his sister's birthday. It was very sad. George was the band leader that night. You the band leader that night? So Mikey, Mikey knows what he's talking about. Yes. And took Reuben Phillips' band. Correct. Correct. Yes. It was a Joe Tex review show. Correct. You know what he's talking about. Chancellor Soul. They don't call him the chancellor for nothing, man. That's My right. boy. Another good friend of mine, Mike. Yeah. I, I know Mike, same amount of time I know you. Oh, yeah. 26, 27 years. That's amazing. There's another guy who knows everything, up and down, back and forth, inside out. Yeah, he does. He knows a lot, man. Right, right. So, Linda's brother was... Yeah, yeah, he was He was performing at the talent show in the prison. He was locked was, up. He was locked up. What did he get locked up for? Raping a school teacher. A male school teacher? Or a female. female, a female school teacher. Yeah. Oh, he so he was just—he was just a crossdresser, but he wasn't. Oh, wait a minute! No, this is another brother. A different brother. Yeah. Oh, okay. There were a lot of Joneses. <laughs> Keeping yeah. up with the Joneses. Yeah. All it was, right. It was a lot of sisters and brothers. She had a lot of sisters and brothers. Yeah, and they all could sing. Wow. They all could could sing, really. I mean, they could sing, yeah. or they could sing. They could sing. Yeah, they could, but, yeah. But you never they went, what, got well, involved. Well, Linda, no. That was enough. That was enough. Yeah. From, yeah. But um, so I took my wife and I and Linda Jones, and we went to the talent show at Rawway State Prison. So all these groups was coming across the stage and everything. I was very, very, um, but I, I was, what you call it? Uh, bored. Bored. That's the word. Mm -hmm. I was bored. And then this group came across the stage say, now, ladies and gentlemen, we give you the escorts. So they came across the stage. And the reason why they call themselves the escorts in a maximum security prison, uh, a convict has to be escorted everywhere he goes. So that's where they got their name, the escorts. So... Now we give you the escorts. So this group came across and they started singing. Got them little goose pimples on my arms. Hmm. I said, wait a minute. I turned to my wife and I said, honey, 
I, I want to record them. My wife said, do you know where we are? She said, we're in a maximum security prison. I said, yeah, I know, but I, I want to record them. So after they finished, you know, they'd let us mingle and stuff with them and have coffee and cake and all. So I told the warden, went over to the warden, I says, I said, sir, my name is George Kerr. I'm a professional record producer. I said, I'd like to record that group that you got. And he said, you can't. And when he said, I can't, uh, a flashback came in my Who told head. you years ago, never say can't in front of me? Richard Barrett. Richard Barrett. I, so I was He got coming, mad at you, too. Yeah, I, I, I was coming off the road, and I was hoarse. And Richard said, I want you to sing this song, George. I have been rehearsing faithfully yours. With the Imperials. Yeah, with the Imperials. And he said, I want you to sing it. I said, I can't do it. I said, I can't do it, Richard. And he Richard turned to me and put his finger on my nose like this and pressed his finger against my nose. He said, don't you move, you little bastard. He says, don't you ever use that word can't around me. He said, do you hear me, George? Don't you ever use that word can't around me. Tears started to come out of my eyes. He said, now you get your little black ass behind that microphone and you sing. See, now we're, we're leaving out a lot of stuff that you guys we are going to have to, yeah, right. you're going to have to buy the book to find out, which is well worth it because it talks all about George's years as the lead singer of the Imperials, replacing little Anthony. And you can find out a lot of juicy stuff about that. So there's still plenty left in the book to go out and buy it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. now you're, now you're down in Rahway state prison. And yeah. you remembered what Richard Barrett said right, to you. Richard, right, Richard had told me. And then I remembered that. And I said, I had taken Kent out of my vocabulary. Now, if this warden would have said anything other than Kent, maybe I wouldn't have done what I did. But he said Kent. And I said to myself, ain't no word Kent. Richard said, Richard Barrett said, there ain't no, no such word as can't. So to make a long story short, took me two and a half years to get into the prison after 500 or more letters, um, me writing to the prison officials to get permission to get in there. But I was able to get in there because I, 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 there was no word can't in my vocabulary, so I thought I could do whatever. And you were I persistent, and good. you succeeded, which was absolutely incredible because it took a long, 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 long time. You never gave up. That's right. Never gave up. Made history three times. Made history, right. And you had called um, all the news channels and everything like that? Oh, yeah. Right. I called them and... and, and and uh, told them what I was going to do, and all of them was down there. And they had all the all the uh, TV the trucks were TV down there. TV trucks and everybody interviewing was you. Down interviewing me. Who was the guy that Later interviewed you? Uh, uh, Roger Sharp, Tony Guide, and Roger Sharp from ABC and NBC. All of the big networks were there. Right. So I told you, them I was going to make history. That, and you did. That was historic. You went actually inside. The I took a portable recording studio inside a maximum security prison. And you paid for all that? And, yes. You paid for everything? 12,000. 12,000. It was a lot of money back then. Of course. Right? Yeah. And then they, and, then, and um, so after that, <laughs> George, not to be denied again, said he wanted to take them out of prison. Yeah, once, to once, record. once I went in and recorded them. The letters just came so much, just hundreds and hundreds of letters were coming to the record company. They want to see them. So I got this bright idea to go back down there and ask the prison officials to let me take them out and I'll 
give all the proceeds back into the prison. And they let me bring maximum security prisoners out to do a concert, which was a sellout. In Newark. In Newark. Symphony Hall. Hall. Yes. Truly, truly amazing that you could accomplish something like that. And then I convinced them to let me take three of them that had been out back into the prison to record with the ones that was in prison to do uh, album three down, four to go. That's right. So I made just three, 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 three times. of them were out of jail. Correct. And, and four was four of them were still locked up. And the first album was called all, uh, all, all I Need Is Another Chance. All We Need, all is, we another, need is Another Chance. A song I wrote. Right. And Reginald was a great singer. Correct. Right? Yes. He was a big dude, man. You know, Reggie, I just want to say right now, Reggie is in the hospital right now. And um, to all his fans all over the world, I want you to say a prayer for him. He's one of the nicest human beings that you could ever meet and one of the most talented human beings that I've ever met also. So I want to give my love to Reggie and his family. And I will let Reggie know that I will be up there to see him uh, next week. But he He's not doing well. His friend, you know, he's in the hospital, so you can't be doing that well. Right. But I'm just saying we're all praying that everything is going to be all right for him. Yeah. So an another another little tidbit that most people don't know that you were the first person to produce Phyllis Hyman. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Linda was performing in Florida, and um, this, this 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 jockey uh, wanted me to go over to see see uh, this young lady that was uh, appearing in in one of these jazz clubs over. Uh, uh, in Miami Beach, and she was singing jazz, and I heard her, and uh, and I produced her. Uh, so the song that I produced on was "Do Me," and uh, "Do Me" was one of them, and uh, I forget the name of the other one. But I was the first person to record uh, uh, Phyllis Hyman. You can pull it up. Phyllis Hyman, Do Me, and it will come up produced right. by George Kerr. And you also uh, produced Florence Ballard's uh, solo album. Correct. One of the Supremes. Yes. You Bring Out the Sweetness in Me. Correct. That was you too. Yeah. Doesn't matter how I say it. Yeah. That's what's name. Man, oh man, oh man. You, you were just like everywhere. And then, of course, uh, you produced our good friend Timothy Wilson. Yes. Timothy Wilson. What a talent. On Buddha Records? Yes. You did him? Correct. Uh, also on All Platinum, you did the Heart Stoppers. <laughs> Man. Right? Yeah. The girl group? Yeah. And were they the girls that sang behind Linda? No. They didn't sing on, um, uh, what was that song they did, the Heart Stoppers? I can't remember. No. When, when the Hurt Comes Back. When the Hurt Comes Back. No, they. They weren't singing behind her? No. But they had their own. Uh, yeah, they, they did an album. Thing. Right. They did an album. Yeah, with the, with uh, Jerry Harris. Also. Yeah, I had a forty-five of theirs. Uh, when the hurt comes back, it right. was it was a one-sided forty-five. Yeah, that's right. Was there any reason why there was nothing on the other side? No, no, no particular reason. You just said I'm only doing this yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked about the escorts, Frankie and the Spindles. Great group, man. And I, I, Frankie uh, passed, and, you know. Count to 10? Like, count to 10. Right? Yeah, I wrote that song. I, yeah, I was mad. And, and you the, the people say, you know, you should count to 10 before you get mad. and all. But so, oh, really? That's what I did. See? It's, it's like art imitating life. Yeah. Right? You get all your, all your ideas from things Correct. people say. Correct. That's, that's your creativity. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my personal favorites that I really had no idea you had anything to do with, I mean, was a group on Old Town, a girl group called the Sparkles. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. Man, you're going way back. I mean, you were everywhere, man. 
There was no stopping you. You were like all over the place. I didn't know what I was doing. Absolutely, you know, incredible. Absolutely incredible um, catalog of work. Um, who else? The Persians on ABC. Yes, that was a great group. Persian was a great group. Which cut did you do with them? All of them. Everyone you, you that did they did. too much pride? Of course. And all that stuff? Yeah. And they were also on G G. WF was it G G, G, G uh, yeah G F right? W W G F W something, something yeah, like that. Them, yeah. You produced them on that label too, Correct. right? Correct. Where'd you find them? I think, if I'm not mistaken, they came out of Baltimore too. Baltimore. I think so. Yeah. There was a lot of a lot of good groups came hey, out. Hey, the original moments came out of sure Baltimore. Did, yeah. Right with Mark yeah. Green. Right. That's right. Right. Correct. He did the one song and he was gone. Right. That's not on right. the outside. Correct. And he was gone. Right. And then they got uh, Ray Goodman and Brown, right? right. Uh, what's his name? Billy Brown. Right. Who was in the Broadways. Yeah, sure was. On MGM. That is Going, right. going, gone. That's right. Not to be confused with the going, going, gone that you produced on the OJs. Right. Right? Right. Yeah. I was talking to Billy one time about that, man. I mean, it's, it's all connected, man. Yeah. It's all, it's, the whole thing is all connected. So you produced the OJs. You produced the Hesitations. Correct. Is that any way to treat a lady? Is that is there a way to treat a girl? You bet it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did the Earls on ABC. That's, that's right. It's been a long time coming. Right. Right. Wow. Man. Connie Laverne. Now that song, Connie Laverne, huge in in the England. UK. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. They well, love Kanye Hey, man. Yeah. They took all our records away from us, man. Yeah. They got all I our records. I love it. I'm glad. You know what I mean? It, it, it w wouldn't be for them. You know what I mean? This oldie but goodies over here. Right. It, music is music right. over there. They kept people going, man. That's right. My friend Maxine Brown. Right. She's been yeah. going over there. I that mean, you know, right. they, they've kept these people Correct. performing. And the, and the people in England right. are, are fascinated to oh. see them. I went over, man, two years ago. Incredible. You sold 8,000 books. Me to look. Not 8,000. I wish I did. I yeah. better add that. Right. right. But I, no, I sold a few books. And, you know, and, and you and were CDs signing the books? The, signing and them. And they treated and so, you like a god. That is right. right. Treated me beautifully. I love them. That's why I'm coming with this new song. I'm recording now. I'm in the process of recording Eben Brown who was for 30 years the lead singer of the Stylistics. So I'm recording them, him now. I'm in the process of finishing that up for him. I got some great things on him. And this, um, my new Richie T and Bert Keys, his name is Ro, uh, Rob Dinois. I mean, and he is so talented. Well, he's got to be if you're comparing him to Richard T. Did, did you hear what I said? He is as as talented wow. as Bert Keys and Richie T. That's a mouthful. And he is with me writing with my daughter, mm -hmm. Sandy. My daughter, Sandy, is a great writer, man. A great writer. And and uh, and, and Noah is a great mm -hmm. arranger, producer. He's everything. So when's this coming out? We're finishing it up, but we're going to try to get it done before he go to Tokyo. Uh, in six weeks, we're going to try to get something on him. But we're in the process. That's of exciting, doing. man. And it's going great. So you also did um, Ben Aiken. Yeah. Satisfied. Yes. Right? That's right. <laughs> man, you're going way back. And you did... Uh, the Perigents? The Perigents. The Perigents. Right. Per, what is a Perigent? I don't know. <laughs> they just had that, that name and I recorded Yeah, that's it. a now big... Now those records are people overseas. Yeah, well, that's what a what big northern talking. record. Love on a sure Rampage. Sure is. Yeah, that's right. And you wrote that too, right? Yeah. Sheesh. Unreal, man. And uh, Lorraine and the Delights. Which one? Baby, I Need You. Oh, yeah. Lorraine yeah. and the Delights. That, right. Oh, right? man. Yeah. It, the list goes on and on. on, the, on two, I did too many songs. Yeah. Well, you didn't do too many. You should keep going, man. 
uh, Lonnie Youngblood, my buddy Lonnie. Sweet, 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 sweet Tootie. Yes, big hit. Right? Yeah. That was great on Lonnie, Turbo Records. Yes. Right. And then you got, how old was little Tracy Kerr when you recorded her? She was nine. When you recorded your daughter doing We've Got a Good Thing Going. <laughs> Correct. Also done by Michael Jackson. That is right. That's why I did it. Right? And she loved Michael. She loved Michael. She loved Michael. And, and she did, the song was a smash in Baltimore, Washington, Philadelphia. We played uh, Baltimore, uh, was just, what, about 10? Thousand people was on that bill, and when they uh, announced her, man, they went crazy because the record was number one in Baltimore, and she went out on the stage. I directed nine years old, nine years old, sang, man. She sounded like Michael Jackson, Did you, uh, right? A little when Michael like was that. very young, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And she she wasn't nervous or nothing. She just no, she, she had I, no I told confidence. I was gonna give her some candy. Uh, okay. You know what I mean? So <laughs> when people screaming for her, she said, "Where's the candy?" She wanted the candy. She wouldn't care nothing about the. That's that's adorable. Mm -hmm. And um, all the Linda Jones stuff, Jackie Montrell. Yeah. Doomed by jealousy. Yeah. Right. The Isley Brothers, it did. moves me to tears. That's crazy. That's right? Crazy. Yeah. You know, when this video is over, man, like you, know, you should guys play it back. And, and, and if you don't know some of these songs I mentioned, and you could probably check them out on YouTube. They're just, you know, amazing stuff. Uh, Troy Keys. Love Explosion. Love man. Explosion. Really nice. Which is how we met. It was. Right? right. I was managing Downstairs Records. And I happened to answer the phone, and uh, I didn't know it was you. You said, do you have Troy Key's Love Explosion? And I said, let me take a look, and I found it. I got back on the phone. I said, yes, we have it. And you said, well, I'm going to come down. I'm in Jersey. I'm coming down to get it. My name's George Kerr. Can you hold it for me? And I said, who? George Kerr? I said, the George <laughs> Kerr? You said, yes, sir. And that's how we met. That's right. From with Troy Key's. That's right. Love explosion. I'm crying. You told your story. That's right. Right. Now here's here's one that I never know knew that you did. I just happened to stumble on it at a record show one day. Tony Mason. Yeah. Lovely weekend. Lovely weekend. That's it's right. It's a beautiful song, man. Yeah. That was on RCA Victor. Sure was. And he also did Scram. Scram. And for a heart for rent or sale. That's right. That's right. There's a guy that you know. It, it just shows you, man, that you can be really, really good and be a great singer and just not make it. That's right. You got to you got to have luck. That is right. And you got to be in the right place at the, at right, the time. right time. It's like a perfect storm. That is Everything right. has to come together perfectly. Correct. Or you won't make it. And, that, and Lord knows that there's many, many, many more woo. people out there with yeah. talent. Correct. Than, than there are that are making it. That's Only right. a tiny, tiny percentage of people really ever make it big. That is right. And that, you know, it's a, a sad thing. It is. And we're not done yet. How about the high keys on Verve? Wow, that's right. Living a lie. That is right. You know, that's Troy Keys. Yeah, right. He also did something on Atco, too. Kind of a corny song. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, uh, the high keys were on Atco as well. That wasn't yeah. you, right? Yes, I did do uh, high keys. On Echo? Some things on, 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 on high keys. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's why they call it the high keys. Mm -hmm. Right, Troy Keys? Yeah. The Fashions? Yeah, I owe you. That's a great record, man. That's a great record. You also did the Chiffons. That's right. A Love So Fine. Sure did. Written by Sidney Barnes. And George Kerr. And George Kerr. Correct. Terry Bryant. Wow, that's right. You better straighten up and fly, fly right. right. <laughs> oh, man. And the list goes on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terry Bryant, Everything's Wonderful. Everything's Wonderful. And I also did that on uh, Florence. Florence Ballard, Ballard. Right. Shirelles. You got the Shirelles. Sure Last is. Minute Miracle. Wow, man. Now you know all of these right? things. Yes. Sharon yes. Soul. That's right. You found my weak spot. Correct. And of course, the uh, legendary "I'm Your Pimp" by the Skull Snaps. Correct. Right. Yeah. That was a pretty big tune. Man. Or it was yeah. sampled. Well, the, right. That's right. That group was the most sampled group in the history of sampling. 
It's a new day. Everybody that's big in the rap business mostly did that song. It was also in the Matrix. Did you know that? No. And the, yes. So you getting paid left, right, up, down, inside out? Well, not really. Everybody's stealing. Yeah. Uh, who else? Sandra Phillips. Right. World Without Sunshine. Correct. They love that song overseas. Yep, man. Top shelf. Top shelf. Give it up. Give it up. I mean, like one monster historic song after another. You're prolific beyond prolific, man. And, and you know, Thank the shame you. is is that the only people who really know you are the people who know of soul fans right. and know about the business. You know what I mean? They yeah. know you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not like... Uh, Justin Bieber, who the right. whole world knows, and he, right. you know, he's a uh, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you're somebody that needs to be known, not Justin Bieber, you know? And uh, the happiest, uh, plus four, the happiest girl in the world. Right, right. <laughs> you get that? This is from right? The Persians, I don't know how. And then, forget about it, man. How about Debbie Taylor? Debbie, no. Debbie was another good sing. She was on a she bunch of really labels. Good. Yeah, sure was. She was on Decca. Mm-hmm. And uh Yeah. Um yeah, I had a few records by Debbie Taylor. Chuck Armstrong. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah. She had the right. That's right. Here's one. Just Bobby Hill. The, the, I want to be with you. I want to be with you and the children. Same label as uh, Top Shelf. That is right. Low Low Records. That's right. Right? Yep. Uh, Barbara Jean English. Correct. I'm talking to Barbara Jean now. Right now. Oh, really? Talking. Yeah. I, I was with her one night at a party down in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian Institute. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And she grabbed me and kissed me on my face. And I couldn't believe it, man. I think she had a couple drinks. <laughs> and she just yeah. grabbed me and gave me one right on the lips. Man. Wow. Yep. She sang with the Clickettes. That's right. She right? sure did. That's right. Yeah. Alice Clark. Ooh, Alice. Yes. You hit me. Right, right where it hurts. Right where it hurts. That's a big song over there. Yeah, sure is. I did it also uh, on uh, Kim Weston. Kim Weston, too. Mm hmm And... How about uh, the, go the the queen of gospel, Albertina Walker? Albertina, that's one of the greatest uh, uh, experiences that I had to produce Albertina Walker. I would have loved to have been there, man, because oh, I, I just gorgeous. love her, man. I wrote a song special for her, Love is God. Love is God, right. And you recorded it, didn't you? Yes, I did. On this album right here? I sure did. Right? I, I, sure I just did. happened to have it right here. Here's the CD. Um, let me see. If this world were mine, that's right. Love, love God Almighty. Mm -hmm. There's George sitting on a, a a hill in Central Park. That's Central Park. Central Park. Did you know that? I know everything, man. You sure do. I was following you, bro. Oh, okay. I was okay. following you all over the place. Okay. And this is a nice CD, man. You do. Uh, if if wow. this world were mine, how can I get away? How, and we forgot about Derek Martin. Man. Der Derek. Martin, you know who wrote that? How can I get away from me for a while? My wife. Get out. No, she wrote that. Wow. And she wrote uh, uh, that song by the Skull Snaps. Um, what was it? Um, can't, she killed me. I, I can't remember the <laughs> song. Uh, Is but, she watching now? Yes. Yeah, Maybe she can type it in. Uh, I, how can I? But Derek... Derek Has did a seen, great job on. Oh man, let me tell you, I love that guy, man. I love that guy. He could sing. When, oh man, he was a phenomenal singer, and I actually became friends with him because he called Colony Records one day, and we were talking, and he goes, "This is Derek Martin." He says, "I live in uh, France." He's over there in France. Wow. That's where he is. He's living in France. Yeah. And he said to me that he needed his old recordings because he was working with Teddy Randazzo's wife. You're kidding. Yeah, and they were, gonna, they were supposed to put out a CD. Oh, okay. A, a new CD of Derek doing. Okay. See, there's another guy, Teddy Randazzo, man. 
I mean, yeah, that oh, guy he, 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 is as prolific as great, you. Oh, yeah. He what was a great incredible. songwriter, oh, man. Great songwriter. And his writing partner, Bobby Weinstein, uh -huh. who's a friend of mine that I speak to on Facebook all the time down there in Florida. Mm -hmm. Those guys together, man, they were just yeah, they were great. incredible. Yes. But uh, Derek said, I'm looking for my old recordings, man. He says, because they want, amazing. Teddy Randazzo's right. wife wants to hear them. Oh, wow. So I had all his records, man. Mm. I had all his 45s. Um, and I recorded them and I sent them to him in France. That's great. But then I never, you know, he called me every, t every time he called me, I missed his call and uh, I never found out what happened with him. Right. Um, with, with Teddy Randazzo's wife. Um, Tommy Hunt is over, is over there. He went over there and stayed. He didn't come back to the state. Yeah, he's big over there, man. He also did love it. Edwin started. Uh, Edwin, he, he went over there and, you know, stayed. Yeah, hey, they were smart, man. They, 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 yeah. they love the American singers they over sure there, do. man. You're right. He also did Love is a Hurting Thing on this album. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. You had a bunch of albums that you did, solo albums. But, you know, uh, Steve, I never wanted to be a, a singer. singer. I never wanted to be that. What I wanted to be was a songwriter and, and Miss Ray Gordy uh, showed me that I wanted to be a record producer too. So that's exactly what I wanted to be. A, a songwriter first and but, a producer second. But but you could sing, man. A little. Hey, you know, let me tell you something. Man. A, a little. I can carry a tune. You know. <laughs> Let me tell you, oh, I, I left out another group, man. Remember I called you a couple of months ago and I said, did you do, I, I, I have a hard time pronouncing this name of this group, Serenadettes. Oh, the Serenadettes. Serenadettes. Yeah. They were a girl group. A little girls That group. you named after the Serenaders. I sure did. They were the female Serenaders. Correct. And they did this song on Enrica. That's right. Records, Correct. right? Correct. Correct. Called uh, Boy. Uh, 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 I forget that. <laughs> Let me see if I got it here. Huh. Just happen to have the record right here. How do you like that? Let me show it to you first. <laughs> wow. Oh, Remember that goodness. record? Yes, I do. It says Boyfriend. Wait a minute. That's right. Boyfriend. Boyfriend. Where's my uh, goggles here? Boyfriend written by Kerr and Martin. That's right. Who's Martin? He was one of the parakeets. Ah. Oh. oh, that's right. You told me that. He was one of the parakeets that, you were, that you were dueling with years right. ago in Newark. Correct. Wow. The Serenadettes with Teddy McRae and his orchestra. And his orchestra. That's right. Out of New York City. That's and, right. and Enrico was, uh, yeah, 1697 Broadway. Correct. Two minutes and 10 seconds. It's a great record, man. Let me see if I can hold it up. That's amazing. Boyfriend by the Serenadettes. And if you look real close, you can see Kerr and Martin. And this is a great record, man. I, you know, I love girl groups, but well, you're really going back. As soon as I saw it, I said, that's got to be George. So I said, what's a Serenadette? That's right. You know what I mean? It had to only be the Serenaders. That is right. And um, here's, here's Ooh Baby, You Move Me. Wow, Linda on Jones. On Neptune. That's right, Linda, Linda Jones. Jones. on Neptune. And that was uh, Kenny, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. Kenny Gamble, yeah, that's right. So that's when you did those monster recordings of That's oh, yeah. When I'll Stop Loving You that's and right. uh, I'll Be Sweeter Tomorrow. Correct. That's one of the, for me, that's one of the greatest 45s ever made. Both sides are like from heaven. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh. I, mean, I mean, what more could you possibly ask for? Except Linda Jones being backed up by the OJs. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> That's goosebump material, bro. Right? And here's the record right here. Here's the record. You sure do. You got it. Right? Neptune Records. Sure I'll be, is. I'll be sweeter tomorrow. And the flip side. I don't know how sure to, do, to do this. That's when I'll stop loving you. Which is, to me, is one of the greatest 45s ever made. I enjoyed that song. Not on the outside. Linda Jones on Turbo. Yeah, that's right. right. Here's uh, Linda on Loma. Yesterday, you did the Beatles song yesterday. That's right. Yeah, and uh, what can I do? 
Man. On, uh, on Loma. Correct. Here's the escorts. Look over your shoulder on Aletheia. Right? Man, you got all these records. You right? remember? Come yeah. on, man. You know me, bro. Yeah, sure I do. Right? Uh, I'm not going to talk about how the escorts wound up on Aletheia. There's, there's plenty of, of that in the book, how you wound up with those yeah, guys. Yeah, right, right. And, of course, I dig your act. Right. And I'll be sweeter tomorrow on Bell. You know, I posted some of those. Uh, yeah, I know. You posted them the other day. Yeah, hit, look what I got right here, man. Oh, man, you got the children. But I'll be here. I want to be with you Yeah, the children. Wow. You sure do? Wow. See? Same label as Top Shelf. I want to be with you, Bobby Hill. Here's, look at this one, man. Oh, my little darling, Tracy. Here's, here's George's daughter, little Tracy Kerr on Stang. That's incredible. How about this, man? Remember this label? Rocker. That was being Rock and Robin. That was you and Rock and Robin. Right. Right. Frankie Rocker. and the Spindles. Frankie and the Spindles. For Your Love, the Ed Townsend song. This is another one of George's labels. Rocky Rocky Robin and George Kerr. Rocker Records. For Your Love, Frankie and the Spindles. Wow. And then you did your solo stuff. Three Minutes to Hey Girl. Right? That was a big one. That was a big that one. That was man. a big one for me. We did over 600,000 copies on that. 600,000 copies. Big, big. It was real big. And you started out talking. Who was Eddie? Eddie was? Eddie was, was uh, uh, my male secretary. And you start, yeah. the, you start the song out talking to Eddie. Okay, Eddie, I'll see you as soon as I go and change my clothes, all right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, here, here's the first one that... Uh, Lit the fuse under you. That is right. I have faith, I have in, faith you, in you, baby. And if you look, I don't know if I can get it to, to be focused. Did if you, you, see you look, on if you look underneath, it says the writing credits is Hobson. That's the name that George used. That was his wife's That's name. That's right. Yeah. W. And the, Hobson. And the flip side is one of my favorite records of all time, SOS by Edwin Starr. Correct. What a record, man. Doesn't that sound What a record. Incredible. I just have a few more. I mean, I have more in my shelves, but I only pulled out a few. Here's uh, Kenny Seymour on Shout. Oh, yeah. Kenny Seymour. Right? Kenny Seymour was uh, sang with George and the Imperials. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. I've got the rest of my life to love you. Right. On Shout Records. Correct. Kenny Seymour. I think he's... Wasn't he recently singing with the Imperials or something like yeah, that? Yeah. No, he's he passed. No, but I mean, he had he had come back and sang oh, with oh, the yes, Imperials. Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, this is one of my favorites on Shout. Yeah, that right. Look right. what you took. Look what you took. Look what you took. Great. Right. Yes. Yes. Jeez. Super talent, man. Really, one of the greats. Thank you. Here's uh, Love is a Hurting Thing. Yep. Right, on all platinum. That's right. That's Love right. is a Hurting Thing on all platinum. Single from the album. What about the Manhattans, man? That's we right. didn't talk about We How can we forget the Manhattans? That's right. On Deluxe? That is right. Right? Which ones did you do on the Manhattans on Deluxe? Um... Did you the do? The picture became quite clear. Was one. Yeah. Um, Did you do give them up? Yeah. That those Ray DeRouge and and Billy Terrell. They wrote those. Right. Those two young white kids. Right. Ray DeRouge. Could, I remember that. Right. Name. Yeah. They could really write. Yeah. Here's one of my favorite. It's going to take a lot to bring me back. You did that one too. Of course. Wow. Oh God. Absolutely incredible. If my heart could speak. Oh, no, I didn't do that. No, one, but that's th this is one of my favorite Manhattan songs. Yes. If my They're heart on could carnival speak. Then. Yeah. Oh, that carnival stuff is yes. amazing now. Yes. With Smitty. Oh, yes. And here, here's uh, Troy Keys. That's right. 
Love Explosion, Troy Keys. Label after label after label after label, artist after yeah, artist. I never dreamt, you know, that I would be doing this much work, you know, with the And there's more. There's more. There's more that, you know, yeah. uh, I have on my shelves. There's, there's more to be unearthed. Your catalog is absolutely astounding. Well, you know. Astounding, really. I'm just, I had a beautiful journey, you know, uh, from west from west palm beach by way of osceola georgia to newark new jersey to new york to the world to the world to the world yeah yeah and you know all, you, to, like to the soul people in england and the people here yeah, right. you're a true legend man. yeah you know i'm really and i i just want to say i'm very very glad that you wanted me to come over to do this Oh, well, I'm glad and that you to, came, man. To all our fans and your fans and all, thank God for you guys. And a bit, because like I always tell the people, it's people like you that makes people like me. Right. You can't forget your fans, man. Yeah, they're they're the ones who make you. They are the ones that make you. That's right. They're the ones buying your records. That is right. <laughs> that is right. right. So before we forget, Oh, we got to do this. This is George's audio book. George Kerr, Hypnotized by Music audio book. It's a beautiful, it's, it's packaged beautifully, man. Let me open it up. This is a real nice package. Oh, man. thank you. Very nice. You see, it's three CDs. And um, it's George. It's an audio book. It's George telling us basically what you just heard Correct. tonight with more uh, added there. Nice back cover. Hypnotized is on the back. And it's great. It's really great. It's, uh, you know, if you just want to sit back and listen to George talk, mm -hmm. especially after today, you might want to hear it all <laughs> over again, you know. And then there's the book called... Uh, George Kerr, Hypnotized by Music. Hypnotized by Music. You can get that at georgekerrmusic.com. George Kerr Music, one word, dot com. Mm -hmm. You can buy both the uh, audio book and the hard copy cover. And let me tell you something. There's still plenty left. You know, I didn't want to talk about everything because then nobody would buy the book. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. But there's, there's so much more in, interesting uh, stuff, tidbits mm -hmm. and hot stuff that, yeah. uh, you know, uh, involved in George's life that uh, it's, it's certainly worth a read and it's not that much money, you know. So um, I'm out of breath, man. I am too. I'm out of breath. <laughs> so yeah. we'll say goodbye, okay. George. Well, thank you very much. And I'm very, very glad to. I've come face to face with you all over the world. God bless you and goodbye. Okay, my friend Nick says Ace Records should do a box set on George Carr. Somebody should do a box set on all your stuff. Well, that's good. You know, no, that's a good that's idea. idea. Yes, a great idea. It really is. But I think that this book um, could definitely be a movie. Because, I kind of think so too. You know, because George George sent me an unedited copy of the book, and uh, when I was looking at it online, it, it it looks like a script from a movie, because George writes jump two years to uh, Newark, New right. Jersey. Uh, the scene changes here, <laughs> right? Right. It's kind of like a script. Yes. Right. But it all flowed. I'm it, glad you liked it, it. No, hey. It all flowed. It all made sense, man. Maybe you have a new career coming as a writer. <laughs> oh, wow. You know what I mean? But, I mean, they should definitely do a, some kind of box set on you, you know. Uh, my friend Mo Maurice says, this was outstanding by the both of you, and God bless. Cassandra says, I love the interview. Stephen and George, thank you both by George. Oh. Right? Denise from Holland says, love you, George. Tamara gives you a heart. Ann Hardison says, thank you. Rick Jones, my buddy Rick, my Brooklyn homeboy, says, wow. Denise wants to know if the book ships overseas. Yes. It does. Yes. You could just go to georgecurr.com. Mm -hmm. um, PayPal does it. 
Yeah, and and I sort of I sort of comment somewhere. Willie Dynamite Bronx is in the house. My buddy Willie from Downstairs Records. Uh, oh yeah, I didn't mention this. Thanks, Rick, because I was looking at all these shout records, and when I said to you before, you definitely can sing. When I heard you do "Seeing Is Believing," oh yeah. That blew me away, bro. Yeah. It blew me away. Linda did it. Yes. Right? Right. But you did it better than she did, man. Come you, on. You were pouring your heart out, bro. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You were saying, uh, uh, seeing is believing. I caught you with my own eyes. It took you by surprise. <laughs> right? That's right. Now, that's that's your heart yeah. just drops, man. But when you were singing it, you could feel the pain of somebody that saw someone with his own eyes and wow. got taken by surprise. That's a monster, man. Well, Seeing is believing like on Shout Records. That's one you got to listen to if you haven't heard it yet. Uh, I, blase, Blase, let me see. Mike Boone says, hey, Steve, the song is My Hang Up is my You. My Hang Up is You. That's right. That My wife wrote that. Right. On right. the skull snaps. Right. Leave it to Mike. My hang up. Thank you, Mike, so much because yeah. I couldn't go home tonight. Yeah. And uh, I see um, my my buddy Blase Lismore, Michael, he was the one I interviewed about a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. He says, um, Hypnotize, the monster song. What a team. George Kerr and Linda Jones. He says he was at her final performance at the Apollo. She said, I'm not feeling good tonight, but you all know I'm going to do my best. Uh, the next time I saw her was at her wake in Newark. Speaking of Sammy Turner, Horace Ott and I were at Broadway rehearsal studios practicing his song Lavender Blue, getting ready to record it. Ironically, Sammy was in the building. He heard us and came running into the room. He screamed, Horace, what the hell are you doing with my song? It's completely different. We all burst out laughing. It took a while to calm him down. Wow. There's another guy, Horace Ott. That's man. right. That guy, Very talented. That guy was everywhere. Sure was. Horace Ott was everywhere. Just yes. like there was a few of you guys, man. You, Horace wow. Ott, mm -hmm. who did the Magnificent Men, mm -hmm. which were absolutely phenomenal. Right. And Bert DiCoteau. Oh, Bert DiCoteau, too. Right. Bro, used yes. to come and see these guys. I was lucky, man. When I was at Colony Records back in the 70s, mm -hmm. all these cats were coming into Colony. That's incredible. And I got to talk to Horace Ott all the time and Bert Coteau and everybody. That's man. incredible. It's incredible, man. Yeah. That, you know, that was a great, great place. I really missed that store, man. I know. Besides losing a great job I had, it was like, you meet, mm -hmm. where do you meet? these people that's right right yeah i mean i met aretha there mm -hmm. you know and the list goes on and on anyway let me get in here for a second okay yeah you can do no no I'm, I'm, i was trying to get us yeah. both in here if we can no, anyway george thanks for coming in mm -hmm. i really appreciate it man this was totally fascinating for me and the, the book let me tell you get the book the book is is unbelievable <laughs> George was out in the streets punching people out, man, and, and carrying on and getting into <laughs> fights. And, you know, he was a tough dude, man. He was one tough dude <laughs> me mentally, physically, and, and his resolve got him where he is today. Man. Thank you. Right? Yes, sir. Thanks for coming, God bro. God bless you. God bless you too, man. Okay. All right. Over and out. See you guys maybe next month. I got a few more people coming in. Talk to you soon. How do we, how do we get out of here? And live video. Bye.